Welcome everybody, I'm Dan McDermott to uh, welcome to Google Plus Week. Joining me I forget where you are. Florida. Florida. Big state is Eli Fennell, internet marketing guru, and basically a smart guy to provide a nice contrast for my hosting skills. Um, Alan is running late and should be here, I hope. He said he'd be here. So anyway, um, the big story, Eli, is the EU thing. They're all mm -hmm. got their panties up in a bunch again because no, because Bing sucks and nobody in Europe wants to use Bing. And so Google <laughs> is... Uh, my, we've talked about this a million times. I want to get your thoughts. First of all, do you think they're abusing their position? They probably are. But no more so than if Walmart wants to put a great value band product right at eye level. And maybe they're not going to carry your spaghetti sauce. Um, right. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, yeah, that's exactly uh, how I feel about that is that, you know, it's probable that when you're that big here and there, you're going to, you know, there's going to be some abuses. Um, the question when it comes down to something at the scale that the EU wants to do here, like they've done to Microsoft in the past, is the question of whether it really has a company caused some substantial harm to the consumer. Uh, you know, has the consumer has the consumer been denied choice? Have they been forced to pay more than they should have, etc.? Well, certainly we can put the "have you been forced to pay more" question right out of the, you know, because you don't pay anything for web search. You don't pay anything for most websites, um, uh, unless you want to make some argument about you're paying in your data because you know data miners are tracking it. Blah 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 blah. Um, have they harmed consumer choice? Well, I don't remember there being as many options and as many different ways to search for different things online five, ten years ago as there are today. Uh, and as many names that are almost as ubiquitous in households to various areas of searching the internet as Google. You've got Amazon <laughs> for shopping search. You've got uh, you know, uh, sites like Expedia, if you want to plan trips and such. Um, if you're looking for your friends online, well, you're probably going to search Facebook because that's the place you're most likely to find them. Uh, you know, maybe you'll find them on Twitter or something, but you'll almost certainly find them on Facebook. It, there's, there's Yelp for local businesses. There's more ways than there's ever been, uh, to my memory, to search the internet and more types of searches that the internet search needs that the internet now serves and so it, have they caused consumer harm no and that is was exactly what the federal trade commission of the united states found when they decided to drop the case um, and i just like to add to this that microsoft's fingerprints are all over this at every stage all the way back to the earliest antitrust complaints against google which at the time they're, they were opposed to lobbying, which made them kind of sitting ducks. They were just sitting there uh, getting slaughtered while, while Microsoft was lobbying on Capitol Hill and in the EU uh, to try to tear them down. Um, and it didn't work so well in the United States, but it looks like they got their wish in Europe and they're going to get the big trial to bring down the, to try to bring down the competitors who are beating them. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, every industry tries to screw their competitors. This is not unique to Microsoft. I have uh, the, my newspaper happens to be free, so I don't meet the, you have to, in order to have legal ads, um, like if you're getting a, if you have an estate sale or you divorce, I don't know if they used to have to put a divorce up there or bankruptcy, whatever, you know, if you're suing somebody or whatever it is, you have to put an ad in the paper. And, and um, it, the definition is you have to have a bona fide list of paid subscribers. You have to have a postal permit. Um, you have to be at least weekly. And I don't meet any of those criteria because I give my paper away. Now, what's crazy is my papers, the circulation in this county is bigger than all the other papers combined because I give it away, right? They're charging yep. 50 cents um, or more. So they lobby the, the Virginia Press Association, of which I'm a, a member, they lobby <coughs> to uh, keep the system in place. And every year the legislators try to make it so that the town can put notifications on their websites instead of having to buy a newspaper ad in, in a paid newspaper that no one's reading. But then the, the VPA lobbies and they keep the law, you know. 
So it's the same thing. And, and I kind of feel hypocritical because I'm against the EU's hysterical attack on Google because they don't suck and Bing sucks. So they get 90% of the traffic because there are plenty of options. It's not like um, Internet where you may only have one broadband provider. And if you had Fios and AT&T or Comcast and maybe Google Fiber came in your neighborhood, I think you can make an argument that they shouldn't have to adopt net neutrality rules for the carriers in those areas because there's competition. The only reason that we have it so am I being hypocritical to say I'm for the net neutrality thing because I hate Comcast and they're screwing everyone? Um, or is it fair to say I could be for net neutrality and against this EU move and do you hold the same potentially convoluted view or contradictory? No, view? I don't I don't I don't think that they're contradictory. I think that they both uh, fit into the question of consumer good. Uh, net neutrality is about the consumer good. It's about the consumer uh, being able to access all parts of the internet equally, um, so that some sites don't get fast lanes or free lanes, while other sites get slow lanes and paid yeah. lanes. And in the case of you know the question of whether a company is anti-competitive, that's all about the good of the consumer. My substantive disagreement with the EU is that I don't feel that Google has been guilty of substantial consumer harm. I mean, I believe if you look at the FTC investigation, there were two or three things that were actually quite reasonable that the FTC asked about, and Google made voluntary changes, things like making it easier to export their ads and making it easy for sites to insert code that says, you know, don't copy our product reviews and things like that. And, you know, I, I think that's all perfectly fair. Um, you know, because, uh, well, maybe some site out there will benefit from Google scraping and copying reviews. Uh, other sites might feel that that's not benefiting them, like Yelp. Yelp might feel like, well, if you can get all the Google reviews for our stuff right there, in, all the Yelp reviews right there in Google, then our product's worthless. Uh, it seemed like they addressed that pretty reasonably here in the United States. In Europe, they had uh, the regulator, the, the chief regulator was Almunia, uh, I believe is how you say his name until recently, and he tried to come to uh, what was even a more sweeping deal in terms of Google you know, agreeing to change their behaviors than what we came to in the United States. They were going to show Amazon product ads and, and Yelp product ads and such next to their own, which I don't think they should have to do personally for a number of reasons, but they were going to do it. And they put it out there uh, to the groups that were complaining, Microsoft being the chief sort of architect of these efforts, and they said, no, that's, that's no good because if they do it that way, people will just keep going to Google. So their basic argument was, no, don't do that because Google will still be the best search engine and people still won't want to come to us which is not even really necessarily true. I mean, Yelp gets 40% of their traffic through mobile. I mean, people do want to go to Google's competitors, just not as much. That's a matter of choice. And that's my feeling about that. Cy notes um, that uh, he says, go to do a search here. And he links to it uh, to actually go to Google and type in search engines. First one listed is Bing. Google's not even listed. I guess they assume if you're at Google, you'd know. DuckDuckGo which is a, a cookie-less search engine, I guess is the way to phrase it. Dogpile. But a lot of these are just aggregating searches. Like Dogpile it makes searching the web easy. It has all the best search engines piled into one. Go fetch, they say. Uh, entire web. I don't know. I well, guess, yeah, there are more some that I didn't even know about. That's because it's actually really pretty worth worthless trying to compete with the big three, big four maybe. Who are the other two? Bing and Google. Who else? Uh, Yandex and there's another one in. Baidu. Like, Yandex is Russia, so whichever one. Oh, Baidu. Thank you. There's no point in competing with them. I think he's pretty much right if you're looking at like a generalist search uh, engine. Um, 
which is, of course, what Google is. And that's that's the interesting part to me about all of this is that Google, if Google was not a generalist search engine, if they were more specific, then this nobody would even be questioning this, that, oh, they favor their own stuff. Look, you go to Yelp, you don't see, oh, hey, how about you check out these location reviews from Foursquare instead? <laughs> yeah, how many well, uh, kayak results point you to a Google Shopping experience? Well, no. The biggest reason why people are questioning this is because Google said that they weren't going to do this. And then they do this. Well, and the last I checked, hypocrisy, if that's what they were guilty of, of going back on your word or whatever, isn't actually a crime or anything well, worthy of regulation. Well, here's the thing, that, here's the uh, thing, though, you, you Eli. There's no law that says you can be held to your own words. That may work in, like, sociocultural context, but it doesn't work legally. Well, it does work legally if you say that in legal documents. <clears throat> Which, yeah, there's uh, a difference I, I between... Would like to, I would yeah. like to know these legal documents where they specifically said and what it specifically says, and I would like to hear from some of the best lawyers out there saying, airtight, this binds them to do that forever. Because I find it very hard to believe that they, they did that. Really? Corporations found themselves with big, broad, lawyer-written brushstrokes about you know what? what they can do in the future uh, that, you know, d that allows them to say a lot of stuff now on moral pretense and go back on it later. They were pretty explicit in, in their IPO filing. And that's a legal document. Yeah, but an IPO filing also isn't something that binds you permanently to behaving in one way forever. There are ways that business models change over time, and you file every year documents to specify changes in your business model and the competitive landscape and things so, like that. So, okay, so if so Google's that's... changed some of their ideas over the years because they've discovered, hey, nobody nobody cares about us for shopping to like you know the way we were doing it they're just going to Amazon so we need to try something else well that's just business model evolution and okay. yeah maybe they said so the something that sounds so here's critical the in retrospect. now the burden is on you to show me their their um, their statements where they go back where they explicitly renege on well no wait a minute you I haven't even seen the IPO. Uh, how can the responsibility be on me? I haven't even seen the actual comments you're referring to. I would need to see those first. I would go, need to see the post. actual... Here's the thing. Okay, you want to... Fine. Either go read my post or do a Google search for Google IPO founders letter. Obviously, if they're lying in documents, uh, legal or documents designed to get people to invest in their company, which would be legal then obviously that's wrong. But I take an extremist view on this. I have no problem with them juicing the results to favor their own products. What point is creating a very powerful, valuable destination if you can't use it to screw your competition? I have no problem with them doing it, and I think it's fine. They shouldn't lie. But if it's in a, if it's designed to screw their you know, to fool their competition, but a legal document's very different than, you know. And I mean, if we're going to go by, like, oh, companies said all sorts of things, well, I mean, I don't see anybody, you know, dragging Facebook to court because in their IPO filings they said Facebook is free and always will be, which we all know is not true anymore. Facebook is freemium now. Uh, you pay to play if you want the full experience. Um, that was especially true when you could promote personal posts, but I guess they've deprecated that now. But it's still, it's a freemium model now, so, and yet they still say it, Facebook is free and always will be. People use lots of hyperbolic stuff to make themselves sound noble and enlightened as a company, and I like think this, we can all like agree this. Google stuck their foot in their mouth more than a few times with their youthful idyllicness about how they were going to run their business. Like the thing <laughs> with, the, what was this, the Facebook competitor that said, you know, we'll never use your, Hello. what was it? Hello. Yeah. I you know I, I they invited me. I don't even think I I don't know if I set even set a thing up. I've never I don't know if I've ever used it. I don't think so. But they're still going to make money from their users just in a different way. It's just a PR scam. Look at Aldi. Aldi's a grocery store. I think Trader Joe's is is one's owned by one brother, one's or cousin whatever and they had like a feud years back and um 
they both i mean it's almost all house brands you don't find a1 steak sauce in there they got like you know b2 steak sauce it looks just like a1 steak sauce tastes like it they just have their house brands i mean they have a destination and they milk it to make money they're not that's a the philanthropist way. they're a, a business organization what's up sheila i'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that's kind of like our local like a store that we've got here called sprouts they don't have local, you know, they claim their stuff's organic, but I'm going like, I can buy this banana at any other store out there. So, yeah. Yeah, it's all so, hype. So, Dan, so you're you're perfectly happy with Google screwing over their customers? Their customers or their competitors? Their customers. Well, okay, I'm not saying that they, that they would manipulate the native search results and why I'm but saying that if they put ads they're clearly marked as ads aren't they we're not the shopping <laughs> results are clearly marked as shopping results they are a vertical uh, but, but, box but, no, no, no. they are not they're not the 10 organic blue links I just right, want no, no, to be no, very no. clear but, on that point those are thing. not influenced by we're any not just talking, we're not just talking about the fact that they put their ads prominently up there in fact, that's not one of the complaints at all. The complaint is that they're putting those up there and then not putting their competitor anywhere in the results. Now, see, here's why. Here's why I think that that that's wrong. First of all, if you look at the evolution of Google's algorithms, you can see that some of the things that have taken a hit on some of the e-commerce sites are things that are applied across the board. And they're not, they're not discriminatory against e-commerce sites. Like eBay has had a big problem with SEO because of the thin content penalties. They weren't targeted at eBay, but eBay happens to fall into the category of a lot of their listings being essentially thin content. Now, are those functional listings? Can you go there and buy those? Theoretically, yes. But that Google's job is not to be eBay. Their job is to create algorithms that will serve up what, based on their results, is the best result for their users. And yeah, sometimes they probably do experiment with things that are not always the best. I mean, I would argue some of the heavy-handed integration. I think you're, yeah, I think you're being too kind. I think they straight up, the best, but, Eli, I think they straight up do it. They have to go with the data because that's where the money is. So no matter how hard they might try to push something, they're still ultimately going to revert to what we, the end user, tell them that we want. So, so, so you would say that Google's search results should be unbiased and objective. Is that a, a reasonable summary? No, because I don't believe that's possible. I don't. Well, how would, really? How would really? you define really? unbiased Larry and objective? Larry yes, said. as a young man, Larry had to look. They speak in nice idealistic speak, but we're not playing the hoisted on your petard game. We both know that CEOs and leaders of corporations use flowery language. Mark Zuckerberg likes, likes to describe internet.org as a charity. And if you believe that, then I got a bridge in Brooklyn to tell you. Put aside their words, you and me talking to people that know better, there is no way to define unbiased and objective when it comes to search. There isn't. First of all, we don't even know the end solution. We don't know the perfect type of search. So without knowing that, there's no way to know what the objective and unbiased thing so what is. You said, so what you said a moment ago was they're producing the results that we want to hear. Yes, we, the so, users of their services, right, and that's right. going to be inherently biased. Right, so, that's going so, to be inherently so, biased. Eli, so Eli, so you're saying that customers in Europe want to be charged more for products. No, and if they don't, it's I, I don't see it as a great hardship to go to Amazon.com or eBay.com or any number of other places, and uh, which, it, you know, as Google said in their statement, often these things are regionally much more popular than Google itself is as a shopping solution, so it doesn't seem like people are having a hard time getting to them. Look, I'm used to checking dozens of different sites and not just going with the first answer that pops up. If you're truly interested in finding the best deal, you'll go for the best deal. If you're the person who goes for whatever you, pops up right in front of you, then and you're the, the guy who buys. And the best deal is this. Go ahead, Sheila. I said the best deals aren't always eBay or Amazon. Sometimes the best deal is right in the store, right down the street. Absolutely. You can get it faster. You can get it faster. You don't 
have to pay shipping costs or shipping fees. If you want yeah, a gallon I, of milk or a dozen eggs, or if you want a pair of Levi's jeans, you're going to find that at your local store cheaper than you will online. Exactly. Absolutely. You and know, I, and for for me, like a layman user, whatever, uh, I go do a search, I find what I want when I want it. I don't care about Google's algorithm or anything like that. It gives me what I want. And also, you know, it's it's Walmart got into a big tiff with Rubbermaid and pulled their product from their stores because they found out that Rubbermaid was giving Kmart. This is years ago. They found out they were oh. giving Kmart a better deal on some product and they got pissed. Costco, they're the number one retailer in the country. The number two retailer, Costco, got into a tiff with Coca-Cola and they pulled Coca-Cola products from their stores. And then they pulled them from the... Um, um, they they pulled the, them, the Coca-Cola products from their uh, their cafeteria, their, their little food court thing. And there are all kinds of deals. I mean, grocery stores charge companies money to have product in their stores. A, a lady who worked yeah. as a marketer at a grocery store said, grocery stores don't sell groceries, Dan. They sell shelf space. They lease exactly. shelf space. You know, even at so my, what's the difference? Yahoo, Google. when they started, Sheila, I don't know if you remember, but Yahoo charged you $200 yeah. to get a listing in the search engine at first. They did? Yeah. Oh. And they were, that was pre-Google, so they were the search engine at the time. And, and what did Google say about that? I don't remember, but they started their own search engine to compete with them. And if people don't like Google and think Google sucks, then they can start binging things. And 10% of them do. Would you like me to quote you what Google said about that? Sure. I'm sure you have it handy. I do, because I have the founder's letter handy now. Um, where did it go here? It sound like the Star Wars. The, the right Voyager here we are. Our search founder. results are the best we know how to produce. They are unbiased and objective, and we do not accept payment for them or for inclusion or more frequent updating. And when, when Zuckerberg started Facebook, he bragged that there were no ads on it. <laughs> Times change. And that it was free and always would be. Look, if you were, and, and that's, I, I feel this is like a gotcha game. You know, if I were to go back through all the quotes of the CEOs of Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Hewlett Packard, IBM, uh, I'm sure I'd find that they had all said similar things and then come around to different views later in life. And this is oh, part of the problem of being a public figure, too, is that in, in the age where, you know, stuff is recorded forever, is if you do, for good reasons, change your mind, because maybe you were naive and young and didn't know any better or just were confronted with a reality you didn't understand at the time, the now you're a hypocrite. <laughs> Footlong uh, is which is not the, to say you weren't a hypocrite, but nowadays, you know, are you a hypocrite because you changed your mind about something you said 15 years ago, or was that evolution? It's not just I changed my mind. It's I suckered in 96 percent of the market, and now they're stuck with it. No, see, but nobody not, used Google because Mar Larry Page said that. That's so suggesting yes, they, they suckered us in. No, yes, nobody. They did. People used Google because it loaded quick and gave the best results and because they, they did a good job of spreading their brand. It had nothing to do with any high noble stuff that Larry Page said that I guarantee you fewer than 3% of Americans have any idea what Larry Page has oh, ever said. Obviously the EU thought that because one of the charges against Google is that they're producing biased results. And remember, it used to be that everyone produced incredibly biased results. Everybody does include, but it, it does produce biased results. All search results are biased. That's the fundamental flaw in this argument: is all search results are biased. The the idea that there's some unbiased platonic standard is ridiculous. And I, I can tell you, one of the things I see, for example, is in some of the complaints, they go, "Oh, Google, they don't surface, you know, don't always surface the most popular alternatives." Well, so wait a minute. So the definition of what you should find is popularity? Well, then doesn't that mean once you're popular, you'll always be popular because no one will ever find anything else? Nobody has a chance to then become popular if somebody's already popular in that market. So that would, say, that would be like if there's a hot startup and maybe it's not as popular as the big thing, but it's the thing that's exciting right yeah. now. You're saying they shouldn't surface because they're not as popular. Yeah, Eli, the comparison there you should be making is with the companies that are doing pay-to-play for network access. Is it? 
and, and well, help. it is pay to play in their advertising space, and they no, 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 they no, use verticals in which they insert their own stuff. Eli, I'm agreeing with you on this point. Hang on, chill for a second. What I'm saying is the comparison there is when Google was saying, "Hey, we don't, you know, we think that YouTube and Netflix shouldn't have to pay for network access for for the last mile network access." Because there are up, you know, there there are up and coming places that wouldn't be able to pay for it, so nobody should have to pay for it. That's the net neutrality principle, and in some ways, that's kind of what Google applied to their search results: is a net neutrality like result. They're not going to favor any particular uh, any any particular company out there. They're going to be trying to create search results that are most relevant, not most popular not the ones who paid them the most, most relevant for users. And the accusation from the EU is that they didn't do that. See, I don't even, I mean, again, to me that's just flowery language. Google says we're giving you the most relevant results. Well, I get it, it's a word of convenience, but if we want to talk in the absolutes, there is no such thing as giving the most relevant results. Relevancy it's subjective. is just one of those buzzwords that gets thrown around. It's a you PR have buzzword. Ten search engines give you thirteen different results, and different people will tell you this was the most relevant based on their mood, based on tiny little differences in what they meant to be looking for at the time. So I, I just I don't buy this argument that Google's obligated. What I think they're obligated to do is to be somewhat is to be transparent. Well, their ads are labeled as ads. And their verticals are clearly ver Google verticals. Do you have a problem and with Fox not News? And around and turning the, the, the blue problem, links. That do you have a problem with Fox ads? News they're saying they're fair and balanced, balanced Eli? The, the problem is not with their ads and their verticals. The problem is that they then excluded their competitors from the search results. Okay, well, but hold on. I, I would look at this like Fox News, Alan. Fox News says they're fair and balanced, and the best analogy I, I've, see, I've heard is they're like professional wrestling. They really look like a news thing, and you know what I mean? They look for real, they sound good, but they say they're fair and balanced. And MSNBC purports to be giving news from the other side of the coin, and they're both spinning. And I don't know. I think they should be able to do whatever they want. Any final thoughts on this before we do two uh, hours? Just to address Alan's point there, you know, just to sort of wrap that up as to. Um, them not showing competitors results. Here's why I would argue that Google shouldn't be under obligation to show anything they don't want to, which is that they have absolutely no control what their competitors do at their end. If Amazon suddenly decides tomorrow, you know what, we're getting enough direct traffic without Google, we think we could get that last little bit of traffic to jump over if we just cut Google off. They can do it. They can riddle their sites with rel equals no follows and no indexes and they can render Amazon unsearchable to Google if they want. Facebook's already done it. It was one of the reasons why Google Plus exists is because all the other social networks were in one way or another going dark to Google. So why should Google, which is expected to honor these requests over which they have no control, these no index, uh, no follow such, why should they be forced to give first-class integration to a competing product that can be shut off at any time just the way Twitter shut off their fire hose in the middle of their live search deal. No, there, there's a valid point. I would say that there's a difference between a site willing to be indexed and, well, first of all, I, I would generally agree that they're under no obligation to index every site, despite the fact that they said that that's their, their objective. Um, Certainly, if a site doesn't want to be indexed, I think it be you know they they should honor that request. Um, at the same time, if a site does want to be indexed, I think it's I wouldn't say it's Google's obligation, but I would say that it is the correct thing to do to index them with the same level of bias as they would index any other site. So that is to say, to not treat a competitor to them differently than they would treat their own site. Right, but again, what happens if, you know, they've got the Amazon shopping results not right next to the Google shopping results and Amazon keeps getting more popular and 85% of searchers are coming you know, over and they suddenly go, we don't need Google. We'll just cut them off. Maybe mm -hmm. these companies, you know, if they're, if they're big and could potentially damage Google by pulling out, 
should have to sign some kind of a contract that, you know, guarantees, you know, crawlability, accessibility for a five-year period. But I bet you if, you if they had done that, that would be part of the EU case against Google, too. Alan, if let's say you're, you had um, a rural area, a village of, say, 150 people, and there was a single store where you could purchase groceries or gasoline or what have you. Should they be under some sort of government scrutiny? Anybody else can come in if they want, but there's only 100 customers, so nobody else wants to come in. Can um, they come in? Or, or does that store happen to own all the real estate in the area? No, they don't own all the real estate. And anyone who uses Google is free to use Bing or any of the other shitty search engines if they choose. They choose not to. It's not like a pipe that has to be laid to your house, like Comcast, See, where it doesn't make... You, you keep saying they choose not to, and I don't know how accurate that is. Are they Do not aware think? of Bing from their multi-million dollar advertising campaign? Um, that would be my speculation. They're not aware of Bing. If their they... default search engine is not Bing. We're talking ninety-six percent penetration of Google. Well, now, depending on whose depending on whose estimates you go by, with desktop browsers at least, Internet Explorer is supposed to have anything up to a sixty percent share of browsers. With Bing as the default search engine, now, I bet a lot of have people no have tried Bing. Google.com from there, but so I mean, okay, maybe Chrome or Android has Google as default. But if people using Internet Explorer are having no trouble finding Google.com, why are people on Chrome or Android having trouble finding Bing.com? All of Bing us app? tried Bing and we're like, okay, interesting, and then we went back to Google. I've everyone in this panel's tried Bing when it first came out, and I think most people probably I tried Bing. Bing when it first came out. I didn't care. Just like all my friends tried Google Plus when it first came out, and then they went back to Facebook. There's like two people left in town who use Google Plus. Oh yeah, Google Plus. Isn't that what this show's about? <laughs> I don't know. I just uh You think so so Dan, your position is they should do whatever they want. They should feel free to do whatever they want, right? I think consumer if, if, if they stop being um relevant, then the consumers will leave. Just like they left okay. Yahoo and went to Google. Okay. So, so what's your opinion on the Comcast Time Warner merger? Huh. That's a different thing. That uh, Google no, does not, not have to physically lay infrastructure to my home. Um, a cable company does. And why on earth would someone duplicate all the pipes to go to somebody's house only for the purpose of engaging in a price war? Google's doing it. Um, Google's doing it because Google doesn't care if they actually lose money on it because they'll make money by forcing everybody else to have faster internet. Google is the exception that proves the rule about how hard it is to compete there. As much Which, as I can't stand Comcast, their business services is good. It's priced too much and it doesn't deliver what I'd like, but um, I don't know if I could say that they should be blocked from buying Time Warner Cable. Because this problem, as we know, is going to fix itself as new technologies, the balloons or the satellites or something comes into play. And um, just, you know, it, seriously, do you know, do you realize just how stupid satellite Internet is? It's not going to get any faster. In, yeah, in, that one's dead. That's a dead horse. Not the, in, in, in the low years. orbit one that Elon's Musk and his buddy, I guess his friend, they want to do higher, dumber ones. And Elon Musk wants to do the lower Earth orbit, he said, is faster than f fiber or something because it's partially in a vacuum. So like it could the, be vaporware. Like Facebook drones. Literally okay, vaporware. It's like the Facebook drone thing. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't see... Yeah, they're faster. They still have a higher latency. There, there, are, there are these things called laws of physics. You may have heard of them. Okay, fine. So what do you think about the T-Mobile Sprint proposed merger? Isn't that dead? Well, it is now. I don't know. I mean, there's a fairly healthy competition level in mobile phones compared to residential broadband. And another problem well, is they're all in the tank. And the, apparently, the there's a fairly the healthy, you know, compared in residential broadband compared to, you know, search engines in Europe. Well, that's but again, that's choice. People are choosing to go to Google.com. It's not that you know Google built people, some infrastructure choosing, and now and people now are, people are choosing to go to AT and T instead of Sprint, except for Dan, who isn't choosing anything. I have no choice. I'm Sprint's well, bitch. I, I think, like I think Dan did agree that there's a healthier choice in the wireless market than there is for you know home uh, ISPs. You know, plus. 
even if you're like your connection stinks at home, you know, maybe you maybe you have to go somewhere else to get a good connection. Mobile, you can take it where there's a good connection. Broadband to the home, you can't take it with you anywhere. So it really you have to have a solution, and sometimes mm -hmm. you only have one, and thus they need to be regulated. And that's you know I think that's the general view most rational but, regulators but take about I'm monopolies. Just... You're not a monopoly unless nobody unless you don't have a choice. But here's the thing, Comcast and Time Warner don't compete, except in a couple of small markets. Right, but that's by design. You should really see John Oliver's take on that. Yeah, no, of course <laughs> it's by design. So, you know... What is so it? Well, okay, there's a, an yeah, absolute... There's a monopoly um, where a company ha is the only game in town. Is there a difference between that and a de facto monopoly? And if... if Comcast is my only ISP, but another company could come in, but they're choosing not to. So my only option is like DSL, which is a joke and probably not available where I am, or maybe it is, but it sucks. Or Comcast, if I want fast internet, is that a monopoly or a de facto monopoly? And is Google's domination of Europe search, which is even higher than here, I think here it's in the 60s and over there it's 90% um, or higher in some countries. Is that a monopoly or de facto monopoly or just a voluntary situation? What, 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 I don't even know. I'm sure legally there's an answer to that question. I don't know what the answer and, is. And that goes back to your question of if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you run the general store. And Should you be compelled to carry to Pepsi in? and Coke and RC Cola? Right? I don't know where to end this. I, mean, I, don't, know, I don't know where to carry this to its logical conclusion, but... I don't think any logical conclusion will uh, come out of Europe, which I love, but they've just spent, you know, they've had a thousand years, a couple thousand years advantage in creating new light, rights and laws and crazy theories, and we're yeah, still like sort of the, the Wild West. Whole, yeah, like, you know, this whole freedom of speech bullshit. <laughs> I mean, who the hell would come up with something as, as batshit crazy as that? The Europeans, right? <sighs> I suppose. I suppose and, there's and some whole, merit I, to your the freedom comment. Freedom of religion? Who in their right minds would come up with, with, with who would invent a right like that? I mean, really. <laughs> For the record, all right, I have all no right. problem with I earned that trolling. But I believe that Europeans perfected the art of the stifling bureaucracy about a thousand years ago, and that part of this going after Google and Facebook and Amazon and everybody else is just sort of a jealousy because they stifled their own tech market so much with you know that it had no, no chance they to grow and flourish stifled their tech market their tech market's uh, actually pr thriving pretty well you know what i'll tell you George, amazon george cozy was telling me they got this incredible model which i think was fantastic and i was talking to a prominent uh virginia state senator about this and he is against municipal broadband but he, he said he absolutely would introduce a bill to do what, what they did in George Cozy's case, where the local municipality encouraged a company, it was a private company, to come in. They wired all the homes, but they didn't sell the service. They sold, they, they like allowed other companies to sell it. So George had fiber run to his house at no cost to him. And the landlord, I guess he's in a, you know, apartment building or condos, whatever it is. But the, um, it, his whole, all the units were wired with fiber, and he has like I think a dozen different providers that he can choose from for internet and phone and all that stuff. Yeah, that's illegal in the U.S. How come? Um, Telecommunications Deregulation Act, I believe. Might have the name of it wrong, but it was expli it, it was explicitly outlawed a number of years back. Leave it to our U.S. government to screw up a good idea. Um. Anyway, that seems like a logical thing. Like, if it doesn't make sense for multiple pipes to be done, then separate it out. Say that one company can run the pipe, and he, they can't sell any service. Or they can lease it wholesale, but they have to let everybody use it. Let Comcast, Time Warner, Cox Cable, Cablevision well, all the, compete for my business. The reason why is because the the the, the basically the incumbent um, carriers, i.e., the the Baby Bells and the cable companies at the time didn't want to have to sell the pipe at wholesale prices. They wanted to make all the money themselves, so they were able to get it enacted into legislation. But then they changed that law and required them to sell it. Uh, the telco access. I remember there were all these people selling 
telephone service and they were just really reselling the same sprint crap that you had uh-huh and that worked out really well didn't it i don't think any of them are in business i know one lady who sells electricity she works as a sales rep for me she it's a she's like you'll keep everything you have exactly you'll just pay less so they're going in and they're getting a cut of the action they're buying it you know if it was a hundred dollars they're buying it for 60 and selling it for 80 so every, everyone, this company just makes money. It's a great scam, I guess. Good for her. Um, okay, so we all agree. Actually, I do think we all agree fundamentally. Because I think this whole, I mean, I, let's put it this way. I think it was absolutely right for Europe to question Google. I think it was right for, Google to, for, for them to challenge Google. But I, I don't understand where they came to this final conclusion. That they've actually done something that's fundamentally wrong here. And I think that that's that that's a subtle point. I realize, and and um, but it, but it's an important one to realize that I do think in the end, Google is more is more in the right than Europe is in this case. Um, but I, I agree with you that if if if, if someone thinks something's a bad idea, then by drawing attention to it, it might make the behavior improve somewhat. But it's kind of like you know. Freedom of speech. I mean, I don't like what some people say. That doesn't mean that they don't have a right to say it. Um, and I think a lot of this boils, at least in the U.S., it would be a freedom of speech issue to a large right, degree. There's like a is. judge it upheld. Is, actually, they recently they ruled that. that. In the Yelp case, yeah. they ruled that Yelp absolutely can say, if you stop advertising, that they're not going to show as favorable an impression of you as if you, I mean, straight up bribing Yelp, right? The judge said that's that's their speech. That's no problem at all. But the freedom of speech as we have it here does not necessarily exist in Europe, as we've learned. Um, the other side story to this, which it is just a side story, is is uh, Bloomberg reported that folks in the know have said that um, that the trade regulators. I'm not sure who. I don't know if it's the FTC or whoever it is. It's looking into this that they're likely to come out against the proposed uh, Comcast Time Warner merger, that it's not in the uh, interest of consumers. And I honestly don't know the impact of that. Um, Alan, do you have any idea on with history if um, – I just printed the paper at 3 o'clock today, and I had three hours sleep, so I'm kind of a zombie, which is why I look great with this giant beard. But uh, do, you, do you know – I mean, is that like a death sentence likely? Or at, at a minimum, I would think that would mean years of being in court fighting that? And likely yeah, a loss in the end. It's going to mean years of litigation. That if if any of the, any portion of the federal government comes out against it, it's either going to mean years of litigation or a special act of Congress. In other words, like um, the what was it? What were the two? The company was it T-Mobile and AT&T, and the regulars came out against it. Yeah, it and was they lost first T-Mobile and AT&T, and then T-Mobile and Sprint. So any. Um, financial advantage they would gain by merging would be offset by tremendous legal fees uh, likely down a rat hole from which they would not in other words it's just not worth the fight so they'll probably give up if this happens after some saber rattling that is usually what happens when uh, you know when the regulators say no or somebody in the government comes out against it is they just give it up because it's not worth fighting it there is some truth um, to the old adage, you can't fight City Hall. So there. Okay, so there we have that. Um, all right, we just wanted to touch on that first story there, and now we'll really delve into these others. Just kidding. Okay, so this next one, Google has patented the ability to control a robot army. And I've got these topics um, in, our, in our Google Plus Week Flipboard magazine. If you go to flipboard.com or download the app, and just search for Google Plus Week, you'll see the same picture that I have, or, or the I forget what it is, if it's the logo for the show, which is this, or you'll see my shining face. Either way, um, that's the magazine with the topic. So Google has patented the ability to control a robot army. And this is kind of a short story, but, so I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but I mean, does this, they're saying army, but it, I don't know if they're talking about like microscopic things, or if they're talking about Let's go kick some ISIS ass, and I'm going to bring my my Dad? Galaxy Note 2 and Dad? control these little soldier guys. Dad? Yeah. 
Dan, you do know that Google owns a company that builds yeah. combat robots, right? Yes, yes. So this literally could be... That's literally what they're talking about then. But is it a Google patent or is it a patent no, by the sub, not, sub thing? I, I'm going to disagree with Alan here. This is not a literal army. This is somebody trying to write a catchy headline. This is really just about a deployed uh, group of robots that are, you know, to which they can allot tasks uh, based on algorithms and intelligence. And yes, Google did buy a company, Boston Dynamics. Uh, that with any fringe fans out there, by the way, that always makes me think of massive dynamic uh, that makes m combat robots. But remember, the Google driverless car also were the winners of DARPA, so it's quite likely, it's almost certain that it's the same thing. They're, it's going to be for consumer stuff, enterprise stuff. They're not going to make killing machines. Uh, they have enough bad stuff attached to their names as it is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure so, they're not going to make autonomous killing robots for the military. Remember that? Uh, what was that website where you could kill an animal? They they hooked up like a rifle and they had some like I don't know a deer or something. They'd stock a field with these poor animals, and you'd literally like have like your joystick at home or whatever, and you could like pay and with your Visa card, and you could literally like hunt. <laughs> I mean, just like <laughs> oh my god. And then I guess they'd pack it up and freeze ice, dry ice and send it to you. Just kind of macabre. But that'd be kind of badass if I could, like, n you know, get some ISIS guys for my living room. Um, I'd pay for, I'd pay nineteen ninety five a month to do that. All right, so anyway, uh, beware. And a Google army may come in. Um, they'll probably invade Microsoft first. Um, okay, so this story here, this L.A. school district demands iPad refund from Apple. So I guess they bought iPads. Really, it's it's. I don't think it's a. It, it's not fair to. This isn't so much a dig against Apple as as it is Peterson, which is the company that developed the curriculum, which they found sucked, or didn't meet their needs, or what have you. And I just thought this was interesting, c coupled with I see a lot of our local school districts here, and others on the show like Harold have said he's seen the same thing where they're getting a lot of Chromebooks. So it used to be, I guess initially, schools typically would have a computer lab where there'd be a room with 20 computers and you'd, a class could go in there. Maybe there'd be a computer class that would permanently have computers. And then you'd have like the IT guy, little pudgy with the pocket protector, that guy and the glasses. Um, and then then they, some of the richer school districts are, are maybe phasing in Chromebooks, um, like one grade at a time, the ninth grade the first year and then they'll keep them the second year and then they buy the ninth grade again now they got two years etc and the big allure of the Chromebooks uh, initially was the cost and also the control with the Google Apps where they they have a lot of neat control there but I think that Apple historically has had more built out educational software available because they especially on the West Coast were by far the, the more prominent computer you'd see in schools at least when I was in high school and afterward when I taught any thoughts on this? Is this a fair dig against Apple, or is this more like a Peterson thing, or you don't care? Well, I think it's a fair dig against both. Apple, as I understood it, Apple um, was was pushing the purchase along with Peterson, so it wasn't that it was, you know, it, it was a partnership. Um, and, you know, and Apple was certainly relying on its name to, to sell this product. And, you know, it, it didn't meet up to the expectations for a number of reasons. Uh, some of which were technology reasons, some of which were management reasons, um, some of which appeared to be straight-out corruption. So, you know. Can you imagine spending a $1.3 billion signing the form and not really testing it first to see if it worked? Some sort of pilot pro. I mean, people. Well, it's it's a little worse than that. I mean, that the the, uh, the yeah. way that the deal came about is is under investigation by the FBI. It, it looks like you know they essentially wrote the terms of the contract that was being bid on so that it was impossible that anybody but Peterson and Apple could meet those terms. Uh, there was some inside. Uh, a back scratching or something going on that the you know somebody was benefiting on the inside from this so it was a poison well from the word go I don't know I think there are many companies that have a 10.6 inch tablet and it's designed in Cupertino California <laughs> um, 
So anyway. Okay, so maybe the FBI will send a robot army in there to kick some uh, school admin butt. Okay. Uh, so but I just add, by the way, that this is uh, when I think about iPads for education. One thought comes to my mind more than anything else. What a brilliant idea it was to send our kids back and forth to school strapped with one of the most popular thief target pieces of electronics on the planet. Everybody from high school and college kids down to like per, to kindergartners. What a brilliant idea that was. Oh my god. Okay. I swear to god I had an ADD moment. I didn't hear what you just said, Eli, but I'm sure it was it was I'm sure it was witty and introspective and I'm a stronger man having been exposed to it. Nah, it's a complete waste of everybody's time, honestly. Nobody will remember it five minutes from now. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, the comment tracker is actually working here, Alan. This is kind of neat. So um, I'm looking at the standalone tracker, and I see, uh, did Google say this on a social platform for Michael Thomas? Google's been contradicting itself for a while now. Social media, social media marketing, etc., the number one quality Google has is instant accessibility to all directions and definitions, and it's constantly evolving exposure quality content globally, with caps for emphasis. Archie was not biased, and it sucked. Quality is the most effective monopoly. There are plenty of cultures that perfected stifling bureaucracies long before the Europeans. The Chinese, the Indians, the Egyptians come to mind, says Andrew Kaufman. I would like to apologize to my Eastern brethren for my insensitivity. <laughs> um, I have an inquiry, at, says Michael Thomas. What search engine is going to be most compatible with Windows 10? And Internet Explorer is out. Chromebooks are in, says Michael Thomas. So there. Um, so that happened. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so this gyrocopter guy, I just thought that was interesting. He flew into the White House. Any illusion of any kind of security around our National Capitol buildings, this guy literally flew in under the radar. He started at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, through, hit the no-fly zone, I think he like an hour or for quite some time. And he's in some, It's a. I, I think it's like a 22, I looked it up. I'd never heard of a gyrocopter, I confess. I think it's a $22,000 thing. So anyone can just have a little helicopter. It's kind of cool. I think this is a fantastic ad for the gyrocopter, <laughs> which is so. There are some winners in this, and I was looking at the. So his whole thing was he wanted to deliver 535 letters to the Capitol, and he left out the president, of course. Uh, so 435 congressmen, 100 senators, and I looked at the letter that was several typos i think because this was a two-year project you'd think at some point he'd have shown it to a, someone to correct the typographical errors um but anyway he's this this uh newspaper did a very slick video and apparently they called the local police and the they said the secret service came to interview him at one point and then they called everyone and said okay he's doing it he's flying into the capital and he flew for like 30 minutes and nobody even noticed until he had landed and I guess one of the people on the ground, the, the tourists, happened to call 911 and, you know, some guys came out. So any thoughts on this? I thought it was kind of just wild. Sheila, you, I guess you follow this. What would you think about yeah, this? Yeah, I've been, you know, it's like, you know, mail will be delivered come rain. <laughs> storm. Yeah, this guy, he's getting that letter <laughs> to you, buddy. Matter. Yeah, mail will be delivered no matter what. <laughs> yeah, it was literally a mailman. What yeah, if he put a stamp? Yeah. What if he supported the home team and put about 535 stamps? You think? Mm, that would, yeah, you know, you know, it's like if he's just hand delivering him, why waste stamps? <laughs> you know, maybe that's how they'll get him. They can't figure a law that he broke because he told him he's going to do it. So they're going to mm -hmm. get him because he's a postal service guy and he's delivering and mail then, without the postage stamp affixed. But then, from what I've heard, is that he tried to tried to call Secret Service or whatever, and he didn't get any response or something. I think that's what I read somewhere. I but, think he told him, and I think they interviewed him at one point. This they, is like a two-year 
project. And they just kind of swept him under the rug, so. I don't know. He didn't hurt anybody, but. And the thing is, <laughs> nobody just... has a clue on exactly what his thing, what his platform was. No, I don't have a clue. Just... Like some sort of like government reform or something. Something like that. But I think like, we need security oh, okay. reform. Now they're going to. Yeah. They're going to put spikes on the White House fence. Like, like technology from like spikes. BC, you know, uh, pointy things on the fence surrounding the White House. Unbelievable. A lot of the Secret Service's historic uh, strength was just the illusion that they were so badass you wouldn't even try to cross them. But Well, apparently they have slipped up on a few things lately anyway, so... Indeed. Any thoughts on this, guys? Which is hilarious. Well, I I would like to, to say that, first of all, the big problem the Secret Service is facing right now is that they were folded into Homeland Security uh, after the, you know, the terrorist attacks, and ever since then, their resources have been really poorly spent and spread thin. Um, so there's that. The second thing I'd like to say is, as a Floridian, I am really, really tired of apologizing for crazy Floridians. So uh, if anybody has any, any further inquiries about what is wrong with people from Florida, for the record, it's proximity to the wormhole at the center of the Bermuda Triangle. It drives some of us mad. So I thought it was, it was so hot. On. Uh, well, that doesn't help, but no, it, it's it's the wormhole. When it's not sucking in World War II era fighter planes from Fort Lauderdale, it's spitting out loonies into the world. How did you escape? <laughs> um, I'm immune. <laughs> there's a great Twitter account, Florida Man. Did? Huh? I said, what makes you think he did? True. There's a great. It's one of my favorite Twitter accounts, Florida Man, and he just does news stories. You know, Florida Man chops off arm with homemade guillotine by accident or something. All right, so uh, this study came out. 6% um, of U.S. adults plan to buy an Apple Watch. You buy that? No. No. I buy that. I think it'll well, become maybe, uncool if everyone has it, though. I won't be buying one. I don't want one, but 6% is only 6 out of 100. Wow. Um, okay. What percent of U.S. adults own an iPhone? I would guess a lot more than 6%, but I'm not sure. I have no idea. Their to. smartphone market share is something like 45 47% somewhere around there. So among smartphone owners, it's almost one out of every two. Okay, okay so this but, means that But six, that's not U.S. adults. So it's 3 out of 20. So about 15 to, 20, 15 to 18% of people who have a, an iPhone already would, are considering um, this product. So that could be viewed as a success or a fail. I, I would like to point out that I read a study back shortly after Project Glass came out that they surveyed uh, U.S. adults and 70 plus percent uh, were interested in the idea of buying smart glasses. The single worst form of data that you can use in the sciences as, as a proving anything is self-report survey data. People say I want this, I want that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But everybody lies, as Dr. House would like to say. And if this was 6% of American adults plan to buy, uh, say they're going to buy glass, how much you want to bet all the websites, 94% of the people have no interest to buying glass. Good point. Um, which is basically what happened. <laughs> That's exactly the way the media coverage was going. Um, okay, so... Uh, We've already done the antitrust lawyers. That's a Bloomberg story. It may have advanced since then. I'm not sure. Um, I, Alan, help me out here, uh, or, or both you guys, because I, I guess this is an HTTPS issue, but Google says the vast majority of ads on its platforms will be encrypted by June 15. Um, why, why is that important? I just saw a story today that on Huffington Post and some other sites that there were some ads that were malicious and either stealing data or misdirecting you or somehow they got don't in the confuse, don't confuse the two stories Dan. okay so this go ahead and set me straight here delivered via https via via secure method is important so that comcast and verizon can't give you a different ad than the one the site is paying for 
makes sense. And that, that's fundamentally what it boils down to, is that Comcast and Verizon think it's their right to serve up to you whatever the hell they damn well feel like it. In other words, I could be on HuffingtonPost.com or FoxNews.com or MSNBC.com or whatever site, a, a, a pizza recipe site, and they could have Google AdWords, and Comcast could intercept, because I'm on a Comcast, I'm getting my internet through Comcast's business, they could uh, intercept that transaction and actually um, replace some of those ads with ones that they're getting paid for? Yep. There's no law against that? No. Why would there be a law against that? Did, it's wait, a big wait, giant. Wait, 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 Dan. Didn't didn't you say something earlier this evening? Like they should be able to do whatever the hell they whatever the damn well hell they feel like doing. Not Comcast. I don't like Comcast. Only the people I like should have freedom. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad I have freedom. So for my my you know for my money it's just it's 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 about honesty you know I mean if if I go to Google and I see the Google ads they say ads by Google and I you know I know that they serve ads so isn't that I'm a using torturous Verizon, interference Comcast whatever I should know that they're going to serve ads over my stuff and I should know when they're doing it well what if what what if uh, are, are two different companies paying for the ad only one showing and wouldn't yeah. that be torturous interference in a business relationship. No, because you don't have the business relationship with the web page, and Comcast certainly doesn't have a business relationship with the web page because they're a common carrier. Right. Now they are. You ever heard of something called Snipply? Even the average person can do something like this. They take your site, they run it through the Snipply, which produces this link, right? People click on it. What they don't realize is they're going to this snipplified version of the page. Maybe it's not snipply. I, anyways, whatever it was, it, whatever it is, it serves their ads on top of any other web page that they that they use this link to. So isn't that you don't what realize they call... that they're the ones making the money. The person who is sending out the link. Isn't that what they call clickbait? Uh. No, I believe clickbait technically means uh, is just like a headline that draw that says promises one thing and does another. That says like uh, Google's gonna control a army of soldiers with my Android phone. That's clickbait. Well, if you go to, go to click on something and then you go to something else entirely different, isn't that clickbait? No, clickbait is like 15 people you won't believe exist. It's just oh. to suck you in there. It might actually be interesting, but you know how can you not click? Um, yeah, so, what what, uh, what 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 Verizon's doing is a little bit more like a man in the middle attack, where they intercept your communication and then insert something of their own into it. Except you could argue it's not technically an attack, or well, you could say it is, if, insofar as it constitutes something of an invasion of, of privacy. Well, talk about invasion of privacy. You know, you've got. Sorry, I'm going to be derailing, but all your your apps on your phone and things like this. You know, it's like. They have, in order to play them, they have, you have to give them access to a lot of crap. Well, it's a, I think Alan hit it on the head when he said that the common carrier doesn't have the relationship. They're not involved in the relationship. The, when you sit down there and you look up whatever site you're interested in, Yahoo News, and um, you're agreeing to the terms of service from Yahoo News when you're on that site. That's that thing that none of us ever reads. And, and um, if, if Comcast were to replace all the ads that Yahoo's trying to serve, and all this happens in a split second when you go to a website, it's actually creating the site, and many auctions are occurring, maybe 30 auctions are happening right then as the site's being loaded, and that is what causes the, the uh, ads to appear. So if Comcast can interfere with that and interrupt that space and put their own ad in there, I almost think you could have a copyright violation, but I don't see how. I think it's like it sounds sinister, but I don't, I'm trying to think how that could be illegal. And maybe Congress would have to step in, but maybe they shouldn't. I don't know. But I, I'm, I think there are Chrome extensions, which are considered malicious, that do this. Right. Well, here's the – well, no, there are Chrome extensions that are considered malicious by the advertisers like AdSense. But no, one can make the argument – that this is a copyright violation because um, because now mind you I think this is a bogus argument but because the copy only the copyright holder 
has the right to create a derived product, a, a, a derive something from um, their copyrighted material. And all web pages are inherently copyrighted material because they're something that has been fixed in a permanent form. Now, this is bogus in a lot of ways, but one could make one could at least try to make that argument. Um, what I, is the I, difference? I, I, and don't don't cling to commercial speech is not as protected as political or otherwise speech. Uh, that would be a shaky argument, but perhaps relevant. Did, did maybe I not. Claim, did what I is even the, come close to claiming that? No, no, no. But, but that's that's the logical defense to this or answer to this question. What is the difference in Comcast um, interrupting the ad for? the Chevy car and instead putting up an ad for a new program that's coming up on NBC, um, which is what you're saying that they could do. What is the difference between doing that and when I go to a Yahoo News and there's a story that Comcast doesn't like that's news content and replacing that with a, a glowing story about how consumers will benefit from the Time Warner merger? What's the technically? What's the difference other than one? They're replaced. They're interrupting the delivery of a news story to the consumer, and in another case, they're interrupting the delivery of, of an ad and replacing it with their own ad. Either way, they're manipulating. And I don't see how ads are not speech, just like stories. This uh, isn't a speech issue, though. It could be. You wouldn't think the well, Yelp thing was. That's how. That that's how Yelp won the art. The the case against the guy who said that. The, the no, the, the, they stopped the, advertising the and they got screwed. If for some stupid reason they actually tried to make the free speech issue, then the counter-argument would be, okay, that that means that Comcast, by the nature of delivering anything, okay, is now violating the copyright of the original copyright holder. So Comcast would have to pay for each and every bit that gets delivered out of copyright license. And remember... Copyright is also a constitutionally guaranteed right. Right, uh, I get what he's saying because you, like you as an individual, wouldn't just get to go and reproduce that web page. So now, if they're saying that they're not simply facilitating the connection to the page, but they're actually acting as a sort of publishing editorial entity, well, then yeah, they're they're connecting you to a whole crap ton of copyrighted stuff they don't have legal right to show you. I'm just saying, if they okay, this is a selective service thing here. Um, and it's uh, the kids filling this out but if they, have, if they have a right to replace the content in the red box which is an ad and the story is here okay if they have the technical ability to replace this where, where is it that says they can't replace this content that's my point now clearly you could make the argument well one is an ad that they're not even writing they're just delivering and probably from a third party ad network Dan? And this is editorial, so clearly there's a difference, but I don't know if technically there's a difference. No, technically there's no difference. And and here's the thing. Both both Comcast and Verizon have been caught changing web pages, and not just changing ads that are streamed down, actually changing the content of the web pages. They've been caught doing this already. Yeah, this is a legal gray area and one that I, I actually think of a lot because I think, uh, you know, I like to use a lot of browser extensions. But sometimes I think, like, you know, for example, if I use a browser extension that blocks ads, and, I mean, I do, I block some ads because I feel that the, the companies that provide them, uh, you know, aren't protecting my data. But one could also make an argument that I'm interfering with the function of that site. Now, interestingly, this was exactly the argument Google used to block the Adblock app from the Play Store, that your app cannot reach into and interfere with the operation of other apps. And yet, we're able to use all these extensions and stuff, which can do pretty much exactly what we're talking about, change the content in the middle before it reaches us at the end, and that can deny websites advertising revenue and information they need to uh, track demographics and uh, but I mean, so am I a hypocrite that I like to have that freedom? My view would be maybe the line needs to be that the user has to know reasonably what they're initiating. So you don't get to slip that in the back door and alter their content without their knowledge. You know, Eli, you just you just pointed out something that I suddenly don't know the answer to, and that's do extensions have access to secure content? And I don't think they do, unless they've initiated it. 
Good point. Good point. So, I hadn't thought about that. So this might actually be an interesting way to get around ad block in some ways. Now it can't in ever now. No, the more I think about it, it couldn't be because ad block can do things like look at the the specific layout on a page and using the layout on the page block it. So it's not even. So if that's the case, that advertising query. So I'm wrong. If that's the case, wait, that last part. Wow, I was wondering if Dan was going to catch that. Um, uh, if ad blocker can't prevent, if if this wouldn't prevent ad blocker from uh, blocking an ad, then um, how how would HTTPS prevent this sort of malicious behavior? The initial store that we were talking about. Well, it prevents Comcast from doing it, unless Comcast does something like install an extension in your browser, which, you know, some some um, ISPs and products have done. And they've gotten caught, oh, sorry, <clears throat> some, some equipment manufacturers have done. This was the whole thing that Lenovo got caught over uh, a month ago. That's exactly what they did was they essentially installed something that was intercepting HTTP traffic before it was encrypted. Okay, so now that we've had a really in-depth in topic, which was actually far more interesting than I had anticipated, uh, and that brought uh, that's a really interesting thing, and, and I think that the scary thing is if they can interrupt the delivery of an ad, they could de de interrupt the delivery of the content. And I don't know if one's, necess if one's legal, I don't see how the other one is, but I th guess you could I don't know. I think they could have an easier time getting by with one well, but than the other. The good news is this is why Google is encouraging every website to encrypt all of their traffic. Two crazy stories, then I want to do comments. We're going to do a fun story about the Roomba lawnmower and how astronomers are angry about it, which is a wild story. But it, This is not but, a funny story at all. I, I agree, but, but before we get to that, um, I just wanted to get your take on the Star Wars trailer. I did not know Harrison Ford and Chewie were going to be in it. And isn't it like 40 years? What was the original movie? 76? 77. Oh my God. It's 38 years. The cast just won't die. I guess Alec Guinness died, but like most of the key cast are still alive. And I think a lot of them are going to be in this. And you know, the, the, the sound effect from Chewbacca, is it the same, like a single recording? It sounds like he always sounds exactly the same. What if they're playing the exact same, whatever it is, just over and over in all the movies? You know what I mean? Because he never like you can't speak his language doesn't mean that you should you know insult it, Dan. <laughs> that, that... That's racist, Dan. Oh my no, god! They, now I've they've offended. Been using, they've been using the same Wilhelm scream in in movies uh, for like seventy years. I'm pretty sure that it wouldn't be too far of a stretch to keep using the same Chewbacca growl. <laughs> See, I should have known. We've added a new panelist with fairly long hair and facial hair. I should have known better than to use all my Chewbacca material. Um, risk of offending you uh, but uh, the other thing was I thought this all the union people will get freaked out but this is pretty ballsy Th they had these protests at Walmarts and um, from higher wages and, and unions and stuff so Walmart <laughs> they went in this is so blatant they went in and closed like I don't know if it was three or six stores they just shut them down for um, and they were like the union organizing stores and the protester stores. They just shut the whole store down, laid off 500 people per store or something. And they said, there's some plumbing issues. It's going to take us quite a long time to go through the, the store and determine the cause and the seriousness of the plumbing issues. And so they just shut the freaking store down until further notice. And like everyone's fired or laid off. That is just so obvious. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm surprised, but... You know, they're all like, well, they they haven't pulled any plumbing permits or anything, but it's just so. Anyway, I just thought, uh, and then I'm going to go to comments in a sec. Star Wars trailer? Huh? That was the only thing you had on the Star Wars trailer? Really? Okay. No, I thought the Star Wars trailer was fantastic. I, 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 it was, uh, and then the Batman versus Superman thing leaked today. It literally leaked. I guess it was in a the theater and overseas, and someone had the phone and was secretly recording the trailer. Um, I don't understand why Batman and Superman would fight, but I think they that's... always found some reason, red kryptonite or something. But one had to have been overtaken and lost his senses, because they're both good guys. And let's not kid ourselves: uh, Superman would kick Batman's ass. Hey, 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 hey! Now, 
I was a devotee, a religious devotee of the comics, and I read all the Batman, Superman things, and I gotta say, I, I agreed with Batman's assessment of Superman, which was, what are you doing standing there letting them shoot bullets at you, you idiot? Fly away from the bullets! But I'm invincible! Well, what if they made the bullet out of kryptonite? <laughs> oh, it'd be like Kiss versus Hanson. I mean, come on. Superman would, you know. Anyway, we may not be able to solve this issue. But we can we can solve the Roomba we, thing. We have but a first, comment pointing out that Peter Cushing is also dead. Oh, oh my God! Someone's Wikipediaing the entire cast. Or oh, I guess on. I am Peter internet. Peter Cushing is pretty damn well known. I don't even know what what was he? Was he Chewy? He was Grand Moff Tarkin. Dan, have you ever like watched the movie at all? Yes, I didn't. I don't remember the. I was a kid. I was eight. No, I was nine. Cut me some slack, Furstenberg. And he, you know what he does while I'm talking? He's half listening to me. He's half looking stuff up. Then I switch to him on camera, and then he trolls me like he knew it all along. He probably, like, I, I, he just happened to memorize the date Cushing died. I had forgotten that Cushing died. I, I had forgotten it until someone, and it was one of our, it was um, uh, Andrew Kaufman who pointed it out. But once he pointed it out, I'm like, oh, yeah, right, of course. Andy Kaufman's dead. This is an odd twist. Hasn't um, Andy Kaufman been dead for a while? He did a badass uh, Elvis impersonation. So anyway, um, let me look at some comments here. So I see... Uh, um... This guy said, all my plus stopped working about five months ago with comments of live events. So that's a question because I'm using, and I'm going to go to that in just a second. I'll show it. But uh, Gerwin uh, is alive and well, unlike the YouTube API, which I think is the, was the culprit here. And then it says, all right, let me see here. Sci, I know um, internet advertising rights will become more arcane than California water rights if net neutrality is killed, says Andrew Kaufman. And uh, latency of satellite communications, that is an issue. That's why he wants to do it much lower orbit, Elon Musk does. He says that solves the latency issue. In the end, isn't it a beam of light, whether it's going through a fiber optic cable or up into the sky? And he says it actually goes quicker in the vacuum of space than it would in the light. And I don't understand it, but I'm not going to argue space stuff with Elon Musk. Yes, but... You still have a latency issue. How is distance in glass distance different than through space? It's still, I'm shining a flashlight in your face. It doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Whether it's through, through a window or that. whether it's through a thick pane of glass or if it's through the atmosphere, isn't, I mean, is a cloud going to d slow down light beams? I've seen Star Trek. Well, yes, yes, clouds do slow down light beams. That's why we can see them. That's why they're not transparent. <laughs> and that's why we don't use visible light to transmit stuff into space usually. I don't think that it slows them down. I think it obscures them. You can block them, but I don't think you're going to I think you're, they're going to reach your this the speed at which they reach your eye if they reach your eye will be the same regardless of what partially obstructs other beams of the light and we are really getting into a territory where I will be uh, proven a fool if I continue borders and boundaries Dan McDermott on the selective service thing um, Grand Moff Tarkin wow and uh, I think Cy is wondering why Wonder Woman is not involved in the dispute perhaps between uh, Batman and Superman so yeah, so I'm looking here. This is the thing, but I don't think it's doing the live comments on YouTube, of which I see none, which doesn't make any but sense. If he really wants an answer to the Wonder Woman question, I I, I know a little uh, I know a little joke about uh, about Wonder Woman and the Invisible Man, but I'm not sure it's appropriate for the audience. Well, someone has to fill in for Pam, if you're feeling a little wild. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. 
Uh, let me try to make this as quick and I'm joking. You, if you don't think it's appropriate, we don't have to do it because Ben's probably watching and Oleg okay. will get mad. He'll get red faced okay. and he'll say mean things to me or he'll come here and literally uh, assault me. All right. So next, uh, welcome Oleg. Hello. Hello. How are you? Doing well. So this, this story here. Is Wait a minute. Is this, I see a little stubble over there. Is that what I see? Yes. But the lighting is better, so they don't see as much of it as you do. Extremely um, handsome, I have to say. I'm like a walking testosterone commercial. All right, so this story here, this is interesting. Astronomers are furious about the Roomba lawnmower. Now, that is clickbait, um, Sheila. How can you not click? Why would an astronomer be upset about a lawnmower? Well, it's, it's not clickbait because it's actually accurate. Oh, well, I mean, clickbait can be accurate. It's just the way you write a thing to where you just can't not click on it. But that doesn't mean it's not a good story. This is very interesting. And my dad's a ham radio guy. He is very, very upset about the auctions of Spectrum and stuff. And I really don't understand it all, although I know it is a finite resource. So apparently this is a pretty obscure Spectrum that is used to monitor um, stuff with telescopes. Radio. Uh, anyway, Alan, you're into this and can explain it better than I, perhaps. I don't know. This is, I mean, the, the story itself is pretty straightforward. Um, Roomba is trying to use radio beacons that you can stick around your lawn, so that you won't have, so that the robots won't uh, wander off your lawn and start, you know, mowing your neighbor's cat or something like that. Um, and oh my God! The frequencies that they want to use happen to be frequencies that are currently allocated to radio astronomy. So radio astronomers are upset because this will interfere with um, radio astronomy in certain locations. It's where an exclusive there are lawns nearby their radio telescopes. It's exclusively used by them, right? The National Radio, uh, and they yes, go to the they go to great lengths. There's one town where they have a lot of these uh, radio telescopes, and and I think it's like you know the thing about a dry county, like uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee, that makes Jack Daniel's whiskey, but it's a dry county, so they can't actually drink it there. This is a, um, an electronics dry town. You're not allowed to have a cell phone or t t I think nobody can have any electronic components because this big Correct. stuff is there. And I think they it's can even uh, they've even had cases where that uh, telescope was interfered with by just like a, a loose exposed wire somewhere in that town. Just like a single loose exposed wire screws up all their data. Yeah. It's like looking for a pinpoint of light and darkness. If you turn on a light bulb, you're never going to see the pinpoint. Well, what's the this this article as Alan points out is fairly light, and it doesn't like why is this the only spectrum they could possibly use? There are all sorts of things like Wi-Fi that spectrum. would prefer a better set of spectrum. Why why are these guys of all things? It goes back to that whole damn physics thing. You know, this this particular spectrum wavelength is used to monitor. I think they said methane. That happens to be at the frequency that methane radiates you know that that the radio uh, the radio waves indicating methane come in at um, and if you need more details on what that means I suggest you go watch all 13 episodes of cosmos it's available on Netflix really really fun watch but he does explain this perhaps I could install it in the teenagers room that's uh, in, in, in my view, it's much more important that we have access to those frequencies for radio astronomy, for scientific purposes, than for Roomba to have robot lawnmowers. Um, it sort of reminds me, of, there, was a, there was a group called Light Squared. They actually bought this spectrum, and they were going to open up this spectrum, but the government stepped in and said, right now, the GPS equipment that's out there that we, even the government, depends on is not sensitive enough it will cross over into your spectrum and you'll interfere with all the GPS systems. And even though they legally owned it, they said, nope, you cannot use this spectrum because it will right. interfere with critical systems. And, and here's the thing. I think it was wrong to give, to, 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 to sell that to LightSquare. I mean, basically, you know, that was wrong. But it was right to then deny them use of it. I think it was unjust how that ended up, but that was absolutely the right thing to do. In this case, it's not clear to me why Roomba can't use a wide variety of other, of other publicly licensed frequencies 
to do what they want it to do. It's probably the best frequency for their application. But they, they, I mean, it's a classic conflict of, of what they want. You know, certain frequencies, like Wi-Fi is actually a terrible frequency for Wi-Fi. The spectrum's terrible. Uh, it was, that's why they let it, because nobody was really using it for anything serious, so they gave them this crappy spectrum, and here we're stuck with it. iRobot, uh, it's summed up kind of in, in, there's two statements. The iRobot um, RLM will be marketed for consumer use only, and iRobot has offered to place a notice in the user manual and on the robot that states consumer use only must be used uh, limited to residential areas and the NRAO says a toothless admonition to use only in residential areas does not suffice so we have a classic thing and probably I don't know what will happen because this is obviously not a sexy topic that's going to be all over the news although maybe it will be in mainstream what, news because it's kind of interesting down to though my robot has no right whatsoever to use that frequency right now. None whatsoever. The frequency has been allocated. It's being put to a reasonable use. My robot has no justifiable reason to get it. That, that's fundamentally what it boils down to. Okay. It's yeah, and I want us to find aliens, darn it. I don't care about robots. I want aliens. You are the antithesis of the Florida man. And a wonderful addition to our panel. All right, so um, we're we're in the geek camp. Although I would I would be the first one to buy one of these lawn Roomba things. <laughs> I mean, I would buy that sucker in a second. Um, oh yeah, that would be neat. I've even thought about why do they have one? You know, then you could have a whole thing. This would be a whole industry of people leveling out lawns so that the, they could use the the robot thing. You know what I mean? I could see like people doing this. How would that work with your bear incursions and stuff? Well, the bears would have to... Maybe it could uh, play some sort of sound, some bear repellent. The bears would eat the Roomba. Exactly. What about sting bugs, Dan? I've, I've conceded that it's their home and I'm just occupying it. I've given up on the stink bugs. Are they Roomba compatible? I think so. I think they're fine. So... This story here, Jerry Seinfeld calling YouTube a giant garbage can. I always get nervous, and I'm not at all upset. I just thought it was interesting what he's talking about. I always get nervous when people write stories about something a comedian said, because you never know how serious they might have been. Like the new guy who's taken over Jon Stewart's thing, and he said some stuff that was offended some folks. You know what? A comedian is going to offend people sometimes. And I remember when Don Imus gave the... White House correspondence thing, and he said Don Imus like jokes, and then they were all fed, you know he offended Clinton. Well, did anyone look into Don Imus before they invited him? If you invite a comedian, you know someone might get upset. So so what? That's the First Amendment. The First Amendment exists to protect unpopular speech, specifically for that reason. So anyway, he doesn't want to see it. He said um, less professional content. He said uh, the less the better. He said I don't want to see this crap. We have a giant garbage can called YouTube for user generated content. We're trying to generate a little higher level. He's talking about his comedians in cars drinking coffee. I think show business is for talent. That's who should be in it. But let's keep it in its hierarchy. And I like being at the top of the pyramid. So I think it's kind of flippant here. He's been, it's a comedy routine. Um, I think he's right. But he's, I think he's got a... I think he's... Yeah. He's I think got he's a got a point. point. There's comedy, truth in humor. There's truth in humor. Comedy should be for the talented. And, you know, I don't know how he got there, because he isn't, but... Other than that, um, I think he's absolutely right. Larry David. Seinfeld was the number one show, right? Wasn't it for like uh, years? It was good. God, right. some of the... I hated Seinfeld. Oh, my <laughs> God. You know they're going to re-release I Love Lucy? And it's on cool. network television in prime time, I think. And the, the, the thing is they're colorizing it. And the funny thing in the article they observed, they said it's going to be periodic. The color will not look like modern color. It will be um, color matching the period, which is absurd because the show was in black and white. There was no color in the period on television. But anyway, so I think he has a point. There's, there's a lot of garbage stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube, and there's a lot of people who have made it. There's going to be a lot of garbage stuff on whatever this, the, the channel is that he's promoting. I mean, he seems crackle. to crackle. Crackle. You know, he's. You know, there's a lot of garbage on television now. 
all of that garbage is going to move to Crackle. You know, it's it's just because you're high paid and heavily produced doesn't mean you're any good. You know, I'll tell you. Um, I was watching Shane Smith, the founder of Vice. He was talking. I think their channel is the most subscribed to channel on YouTube. Has the longest retention of viewers. In the demo, it's num it's number one. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of garbage. It's democracy. There's a lot of stupid people who can vote and a lot of smart people who can vote. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you have, if you watch one of the big three network channels, you're more likely to find a quality program than when you're scanning the obscure cable channels. I think it's the same thing on YouTube. No, it's, you're not. I think so. If you go at at eight, nine, ten p.m. What's the number one rated show these days? Huh? What's the number one rated show? Isn't it some stupid dancing thing or whatever the hell? Or no, the the, Game the of race, Thrones. the amazing ray. I don't know. That's garbage. Game of Thrones, dude. Yeah. It's Game of Thrones. Oh, I I I actually got. I'm thinking about getting uh, HBO specifically for that. What? What's number two? I have no idea. I believe it's House of Cards. Mm. -mm. No way. Because uh, Orange is the New Black is actually Netflix's number one show, not House of Cards. The chick flick beats the uh, political show every time. Um, but I'm talking, I mean, typically if you go to NBC, CBS, or ABC in prime time, not on Friday, you're more likely to find something quality if you than if you randomly went to a spun the dial and landed on some YouTube channel. But it's also very, very expensive. They spend more on a single episode of Seinfeld than any of us, all of us combined, will have spent in our lifetimes creating YouTube content. Probably a hundredfold, if not more. I think he has a point. Well, there's... There's a um, there's a, there's a, a saying. Uh, I'm not sure who coined it. It's just one of those things that's out there that goes. Uh, we used to believe that a million monkeys banging on a million keyboards would eventually reproduce Shakespeare. Thanks to the internet, we now know this isn't true. Well, YouTube is is, is kind of like that. You've got millions of monkeys essentially producing millions of videos. Most of them are not high quality. And you're not getting, I mean, I mean, just from my experience, for the most part, you're not getting Shakespeare in the sense you're not getting House of Cards or Game of Thrones on YouTube. But, but there is enough out of there that rises to the top that, well, it may not be Shakespeare. It's, I don't know, some, you know, more popular but far less eloquent uh, writer, Harlan Ellison or something like that. Uh, but I also, I have to say that I think that for all the uh, you know years that I spent on YouTube, I have yet to experience YouTube as that first video screen thing for me. Really, you know, the like I'm going to go to YouTube and watch everything I'm going to watch for the evening tonight. Well, there's also uh, a generation gap here. You know, there's a generation yeah. gap here, though. Um, the kids in the bedroom absolutely he's on Facebook and he's on YouTube. He is. I've offered to put a TV. He does has no interest. He has a TV. He was using it for his Xbox. He has absolutely zero interest in Netflix or Amazon Prime, and I've shown him how to use it. No, he doesn't want to watch any of the network stuff. He never watches that stuff. He wants Facebook and YouTube. That's it. Yeah, both right, but is he going to be that way when he grows up, or is that just, you know, he's Probably, just a kid. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, the content, because really YouTube's been around long enough to where we should be able to take some measurement of that. Our 20-somethings, I think they've gravitate, they've transferred over from YouTube to, to Netflix, and primarily, and to a lesser degree, Amazon Prime, the kids who were really YouTube freaks, you know, just a few years ago, the the 20-somethings, right? So I think there's some of that. But clearly, if it's just like, you know, comparing YouTube to a, a cultivated higher budget thing is like comparing um, an Amazon's self-publishing platform to the content you'd find in a Barnes & Noble. The odds of finding a quality book in Barnes & Noble, uh, it, it's less of a gamble than um, randomly spinning the dial for some anybody can do it book you know print on demand stuff so there's nothing wrong with either although it's a lot more expensive as we've learned to have a Barnes and Noble than to do a print on demand where there, there might be zero cost up front or a small setup fee and then they just 
charge they sell the book you know or like a kindle book where there's actually no cost per copy or a fraction of a cent um once it's formatted i think this is yeah, he has a point you know he, he used to be a show where they all got a million dollars an episode so yeah it's going to be pretty darn good production quality but try to do that on youtube and it's the, the model doesn't work you know if you had the same viewer count that he had um what did they get say they had 50 million viewers what's that on um on youtube 50 million viewers what's that 20 grand revenue maybe 200 grand maybe half a million dollars that's not enough to pay one of the cast members of a seinfeld episode well yeah and i mean i mean this is one of those areas where uh you know it was clear watching over the years that google really wanted to see companies big content companies bring that full-length content to youtube but that's exactly it it was never really worth it for them to do it um and i think particularly now with google wanting to charge people ten dollars a month for ad free youtube it's time for them to take the reins themselves and they either need to do like what amazon and netflix have done and make their own content studios and make their own content or find somebody to partner with who can be like the you know, one or two at least who can be exclusive, high quality content creators for the new YouTube subscription. Well, because to my mind, that's the only way they're ever going to be more like Netflix or Hulu in my life, is if they have higher quality content. That's what they're doing. That's why they set up the YouTube studios in Los Angeles, New York, and London. And promptly ended the relationship with most of the people that they advance funded. They said they're going to pay people to create content, but really they were advancing them against their future YouTube earnings. I'm doing the math here based on, I've had one super viral video, and um, I'm doing the math. If I convert that to 2 billion views, it'd be $12.5 million. So Gangnam, Gangnam Style, based on what I earned from my video, Gangnam Style earned about $12 million bucks. So I would guess anywhere from say eight million to twenty million, because it all depends for, on the video. Now that's less than style, probably one gangbusters. episode of Seinfeld cost, and that's the number one video in the history of YouTube by far. That's the Thriller album for YouTube, Gangnam Style. So that probably I'm guessing made in the low teens, maybe fifteen million, twenty max, and a low of nine ten. So I'm guessing about twelve thirteen million dollars, and that is probably less than a. I think that's about what a House of Cards episode costs. There's no money in YouTube. I mean, but it's a slice of the pie, right? A 7-Eleven cannot exist just selling cigarettes or just selling beer or just selling hot dogs or gasoline. They sell all those things. And they make a little bit of money from each thing, and that's how a 7-Eleven can make money. It's the same thing. Now they're they're selling stuff um, for, for companies that want to have content on phones. There's a big race, especially in emerging markets and in Europe and stuff where... There's so much competition with phones. They'll have exclusive content you can watch just on this. Just like we saw where uh, Apple has a deal with HBO for three months where you, if you want Game of Thrones, you don't want to, you know, it's 80 bucks to upgrade your plan or you can just spend 14.99 with HBO and get it directly. You got to have an Apple product to sign up. So I think we're seeing a lot of people, there, there is still a race for good quality content. Seinfeld is absolutely correct on that. People are looking for it. There is sometimes, we've all done this. We get down on Netflix and we're like, I can't find anything good. Right? There's like a hundreds of millions of things, right? And I swear to God, probably after the show tonight, I'll get on Netflix and I'll be like, oh, I've already seen Voyager twice. I've seen, you know, maybe there's a good Charlie Rose episode. No, I don't know. I mean, Eric Schmidt again. You know, I mean, it's just, there's so much out there. It's still a, it's still a search issue. It's a discovery issue. But you're, the odds, I mean, there are destinations other than YouTube where you might, at least in my age group, find content I'm more likely to be interested in to hold my attention. If I want quick hits that are funny, the kid will bring stuff and you know Dan? anyway. Dan? Yeah 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 go ahead. Dan? Alan. Nothing. Nothing can hold your attention. What were we talking about? I had someone was gonna <laughs> say <laughs> Alright. I was gonna make a good point. But I can't remember. Alright. Um Ooh, that I don't know if I added this or not. Uh, okay, so I guess I did. Maybe I did it at three in the morning when I was trying to put a paper out. Okay, 
IT service firm alleged to have overwhelming South Asian workforce in the U.S. Um, I've never heard of such a thing. An IT worker is accused accusing Tata Consultancy Services of discrimination against American workers in favoring South Asians, translation Indians, uh, in hiring and promotion. It's uh, backing up its complaint in part with numbers. I think I added this hoping Sreek would come on so I could troll him. The lawsuit filed this week in federal court in San Francisco claims that 95% of the 14,000 people they employ in the U.S. are South Asian or mostly Indian. It says this practice has created a grossly disproportionate workforce. India-based Tata I mean, what's the difference? Be that's like if if you had an American company, you went to India and you hired some Americans. I mean, what the hell's wrong with that? Um, I don't have a problem with an Indian company coming here and hiring Indians. Anyway, the uh, lawsuit alleges first the company hires large numbers of H-1B workers uh, from 2011 to 2013. They sponsored nearly 21,000 new H-1B visas, all primarily Indian workers, according to the lawsuit's count. Secondly, when they hired locally, such persons are still disproportionately South Asian. Third, for the relatively few non-South Asian workers that they hire, it disfavors them in placement, promotion, and termination decisions. That is certainly a subjective criteria at best. The lawsuit which seeks class action status is similar to a lawsuit filed against Infosys by the same Washington firm. Is there anything to this, Alan? Did you ask me something, Dan? Anything to this? Let's ask the... He hates it when I call him Russian guy. What do you think about this? Oleg, I don't have a problem with an Indian company coming here and hiring some Indians. You don't have a problem with them violating immigration law? Are they violating? It says they got H-1B visas. They're not sneaking them in tunnels. Yeah, but look at how look at the H-1B visa program and what it's supposed to be used for. You don't think it? I mean, are they? Is this? A, we, I don't have enough details here. I mean, are they hiring these guys and, and housing them in slums and paying them Anybody minimum know, wage? Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. a wage issue. <laughs> Look at Dan. They, yeah. Look at what the H one B visa program is supposed to be for. If you it's can't find local be, homegrown talent, then right. you use this to get the special skill sets, usually high skilled STEM stuff. And and there's not right. enough of them to go so, around. And Mark Zuckerberg on down, they're all bitching about that. That there's not enough. Right. So, so if 75% of your company is made up of people with H-1B visas, might there be an indication that they're just trying to screw over the immigration law? Maybe? You mean take advantage of it to get people because they want brown? I mean, you saying what are you saying? They want brown guys, or what? What is? Or people who fit into their culture, or what? I'm not. At, I'm. I have no idea why. I don't care why either. I'm just interested if they're abusing the H-1B visa law. If they're doing it legally, I mean, I don't know. There's no allegation you, that they're violating the law. The law legally? How do you abuse the law legally? If you abuse it, it's not legal anymore. <laughs> We've already finished the Comcast uh, topics, Oleg. <laughs> well, I mean, I, the, the argument here would be that some laws, you know, they, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily going to, like, micromanage, for example, every single person you try to get signed up for the visa. But if the point of the law was to bring in skilled workers when those uh, when when those skilled workers weren't available locally and those workers were available locally then it was abusing the purpose of the program uh... it's a subjective argument but those kind of arguments often do lead people to get frustrated with a program which leads to new restrictions that often aren't even good like uh, you know, one welfare queen takes advantage of the system. Suddenly, we got laws that are hurting people that are, you know, using the system correctly. So that's why it matters when somebody manipulates the spirit of a program, even if they're keeping to the letter of it. And this, and I'm going to say, this is, a, you know, this is I'm an I'm an American straight white male, which means I'm the one group in the United States of America that, according to every other group, <laughs> You're not cannot be discriminated against. That's the thing. No see? laws protect me whatsoever. We all the go, theory is I'm so protected by privilege, I don't need those laws. Well, I've never enjoyed any particular privilege that I'm aware of. But <laughs> okay, uh, as hey, he, as he lives in like this wonderful place in Florida, uh, but yeah. So, I mean, we've all seen. You know, you go to the the Jewish owned camera store, and there's a you know a bunch of other. Jewish photographers there. You go to the Italian restaurant, and there's a bunch of Italians. You go to the Mexican restaurant, there's a bunch of Mexicans working in there. I don't have a problem with that. Um, although you could make an argument in the restaurants that they're specifically hiring uh, to, to save labor because, 
guys who look like me might want more money or be unwilling to do to actually earn our living, right? Um, Could also be that guys like you and me are just not any good at making Mexican food. Well, speak well, that's also the accusation with the H-1B visa program. Although they're supposed to be pay paid prevailing wage, there's an accusation out there that in general they don't. And especially if you're talking about the fact that you're hiring, you know, 75% or whatever huge percentage, what is the prevailing wage? That's the one really that would be the, the that that's the one relevant thing here to me, Alan, that's not in the article um that I saw, but I would want to know, like, are they saving money by flying Indians in? Are they paying them less than they would have to pay an American? Because there is an argument to be, like, on some of the physical stuff, which doesn't apply. This is a unique thing. You're saying you're discriminating against white people, and it's a high-wage tech industry. This is kind of a unique case. Um, like As Eli said, we're like the, the – of the groups that are not specifically protected, um, we are the least protected. And I just, uh, I, I could see without the data of, are they saving money? What's the incentive to do this? If it's cultural, like the cameras, like if you go to B&H photo, you know, there's a common, you know, characteristic. And, and if you go to the Italian restaurant or the Mexican restaurant or whatever, you can see a common characteristic. I think that's not necessarily a financial thing. It's more like a cultural thing, and I have no problem with that. When we were in the embassies overseas, it was mainly the Americans who did all the important jobs, and the local guys would, like, clean or run the cafeteria. But that was, there were secrets and stuff, so it was, like, loyalty there. I mean, it was a, yeah. not well, no, but Alan, Look, Alan said, though, if they're not, if they're breaking the law, it's a totally different ball game. Forget about cultural, having problem, not having problem. If they're not doing it legally, it's a problem. Well, they're trying to define, now they're trying to say that you're discriminating against white males. And are, are they? And, and for what purpose? How you just compared this company company to an embassy? That's I'm, that's just rich, Dan. That's how and I. Even for you, that's a good one. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm grasping at straws. I'm trying to find an analogy to a company that goes overseas and hires its own, for whatever reason. Um, we don't know why. No, par partially the question. That's a cultural thing. People speak your language, you know their customs. I mean, all that stuff certainly works on all levels. I mean, everybody wants to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm totally with Alan on this. If it's illegal, they shouldn't be doing this. Well, it, it's a language, civil matter if it, if it is. I, I just, like, I, I see White House applesauce. They're right here in Winchester. And they literally have, a, it's Camp Jamaica. They go and they get these guys from Jamaica. They fly them here or whatever, however they get them here. They house them. They feed them. If they could find local kids in Winchester to pick the freaking apples, it would probably cost them a whole lot less Dan, to get the apples picked than flying someone from Jamaica and housing them and giving them room and board and then flying them back after the season. But Dan, they can't find the locals, so they go to Jamaica. Yes, sir. Are they using H-1B visas to bring them in? Um, how is that the distinguishing characteristic? If they're filling the form out, what, what, what are they violating? They're saying the H-1Bs, but I don't see where that's related to the lawsuit. That's just the, the means by which they're doing it. Because H-1B visa, every visa has specific criteria about bringing, about when you can bring somebody in. H-1B visas are supposed to be very, very targeted for very, very specific career fields for very, very specific purposes. And one of the purposes is not that you like having people of the same culture around you. There are different visas for that. And that's fine. But that's not what H-1B is supposed to be for. Right. Like, I mean, let's suppose that uh, this is one thing I could see being very possible. You know, maybe the, a lot of this is like people bringing their families in, right? Well, as Alan says, there are other sorts of visa processes you'd, you'd go through, other sorts of immigration processes you'd go through to bring family other, over other than claiming you needed this professional visa when you don't really need it. I just get, you know, maybe I'm old-fashioned but I just think people whine too much and, and think everyone owes them something and I think you know if this guy doesn't want to work there go work somewhere else but I know there's no H1B for a apple picker or an unskilled dishwasher in a Mexican restaurant or an Italian restaurant so that is a distinct characteristic and yet all the restaurants have Mexicans washing dishes but you know Oleg if you were in a city 
where they didn't like Russians or whatever, you know what you'd do? You'd start your own business. And you aren't in a, you are not in a city where they don't like Russians, but you did start your own business and nobody mm -hmm. owes you anything. You earn your money every day. I came here legally though. Dad, you're, you're like the only I'm one. Boom. Yeah, no, Dad. <laughs> Eli. I'm, <laughs> Boom. I'm confused. Who owes who what here? They're saying that, you know, that this that they're being discriminated against in in their I assume he's a white guy. I don't know. Maybe he's black or I don't know what he is. Um, I don't know if it's a he. It's a class action, so I guess it could be a combination of things. I don't know. Was he really? I mean, is he really saying that they owe him something, or is he saying that he feels that he, you know, may have earned something? Uh, uh, or 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 could have earned something had the company not been favoring hiring certain types of people because certainly that's a legitimate complaint you know if you're a black person and you're working at Walmart or something right and you're working harder and you're managing everybody else's job and all the white people around you are getting promoted at some point you're gonna be like yeah this ain't cool now again the problem is, is the assumption that you know because we have white skin you know, and we're men that we can't be discriminated against. Uh, that privilege somehow shields that from ever, ever happening, and it, it doesn't. Uh, I've been racially profiled by non-white cops. I I know I have not gotten jobs because I was not the preferred skin color of the employer. Now, uh, delve into details I, here. Are you oh, painting with a broad brush? Cop, but, huh? <laughs> you were discriminated against. And give me a spe not a company name, but like, what kind of job did you apply for? Was it the long hair, or was it because you were white? No, I'm I'm quite confident it was because of my skin color. I can't prove that, and I didn't try to lodge a complaint or, or anything, but it was at the time it was temporary work helping to register people to vote, and I'm quite sure that and, and they probably would have argued, you know, that, oh, I didn't look right for the neighborhoods they were going to send me into. They wanted whatever, you to go register blacks, was, and they wanted people who were black to go in there. Right. And I don't right. think there's anything wrong with that. Well, I could sort of get Why? the idea, Why? but Why at the same time, if you that? did that, if you said the black people can't go register the white people, I can only imagine how fast the Reverend Jesse Jackson would fly into town. No, 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 well, but hold on a second, Eli. Dan, explain that, because I don't get that. Well, do I, th I think if you, if you find that, and Ferguson comes to mind, where the vote, which primarily black town, and they're getting ripped off by the town council, could not be more corrupt, reminds me of something from your former homeland, and absolutely 15% uh, voter participation. And when the mayor ran, I think it was like 25 or 30%, if that. That is ridiculous. So they're getting literally screwed and ripped off and, and abused by the people. Um, they're using them as a personal piggy bank. And there was like one black person on the town council. And there's like three black cops. The city of, I think, 45,000. None of them vote. So... If you go to the obviously the white people are voting, and so if you were some activist, as Obama uh, uh, was a community organizer, but that was more of a union thing, I think. Um, but if the census determined that you know what, we're not like Australia where everyone has to vote. A lot of people don't vote, and you can make an argument that if you don't pay attention or give a damn, you shouldn't vote because you're probably going to just vote on name ID or make a stupid decision anyway. But in the end, if you decided that you find a group is disenfranchised. Uh, just like if Google Fiber wanted to go into black neighborhoods because they're not getting the uh, sign-up rates that they would like, I think that they might want to get blacks to go in there. Or if you were going to a Russian neighborhood or a Hispanic neighborhood, you can make a stronger case there because you'd want someone who was a Hispanic and spoke Spanish to try to sign people up or get them to register to vote or what have you. If you were going to a gay neighborhood or a whatever, you might want people who, you know, if they're not, if they're, if they're disenfranchised for whatever reason, if they're not participating for whatever reason, maybe you want to get people they can identify with to say, hey, why don't you come and participate? Why don't you sign up to vote? Why don't you, uh, you know, join this club? Why don't you consider Google Fiber? It is relevant. And there's a value uh, proposition here. I don't have a problem with that. If you're blatantly, if they're, because in all those cases, there's a reason for it that makes sense. If the reason is, I hate substitute N-word or your favorite pejorative there, that is not a valid reason. To say, we're trying to sign up blacks because they're not voting, and we, with, without all due respect, we want to get black people to go in there because 
they, they maybe he can talk the talk better. Or we want to get Italians to go in the Italian, or the Jewish ghetto, we want to get Jews to go in there, or the Russian ghetto, we want to get Russian, you know, someone who speaks like Oleg to go in there because he's going to be more effective. And it's not because I hate blacks or I hate whites or I hate gays or straights or Christians or atheists. It's because if, if you're trying to do accomplish a goal and there's an under participation rate, there's a, a negative, a low participation rate, and you're trying to improve that, I think having someone who they can identify with. It's the same thing if you're trying to sell a beer and you have a hot girl, a guy is more likely to tip well and buy the beer than if you have a someone who looks like me, you know, who's <laughs> Yeah, but like you always said, it works really for certain people. It doesn't work for everybody that way. True, and every yeah. story is different. Blatant discrimination, you know, I hate uh, I, I must group. have missed I, I must have missed Dr. King's, you know, famous speech about, you know, we don't need any help, white people. <laughs> we're we're in it alone. <laughs> We don't need no white people helping out with our cause. Um, and I'm just saying this particular organization, uh, I'm not going to say their name, but you all know who they are. <laughs> the they U.S. Are the Census Bureau, famous, right? Or signer up group. Uh, <laughs> they had so many There's problems with the workers they sent to those neighborhoods that there's no way they could make a rational argument that they were doing better by not letting you know, somebody like me who you know, wouldn't turn in a form with 50 signatures all identical for a person who doesn't exist. And, and anyways, it was a pay-per-voter thing, and I mean, it would have been very easy for me to essentially self-select out if I wasn't any good at it. Uh, and, you know, the, it's a very slippery slope when we start saying, you know, what reasons are okay to favor some groups and what are not. I get there may be areas where it's contextually preferable, but, were you off? Were you, know, were you interviewed of on paper? Like law enforcement decisions, I'm very wary of that kind of thinking. Were you interviewed? Um, were you evaluated based on a piece of paper, like they looked at your resume and you were rejected, or did someone have a conversation with you for at least thirty seconds? Because I can't imagine if someone had spoken to you and met you that you would not have had um, a favorable impression on them that would have superseded any objections based on the fact that you're, you know, obviously a, an evil white person. And I don't think they thought I was an evil white person. It's I probably because be you're from that. Florida. I mean, what other excuse does someone need? <laughs> I, I think they just, well, they were too. Uh, I think that they, they were just following a theory, which, you know, uh, as you said, there may be cases where it makes sense, but it's a very dangerous, slippery slope theory that those like us are going to do better for our group. And, you know, just, again, I don't recall Dr. King ever saying, you know, thanks, white people, we don't need your help, we're in this on our own, you know? I mean, if somebody from another group is is there and they're willing to help, you know, give them a chance. Don't make assumptions. Ideally, uh, you would have a colorblind society. It's not so much degree. colorblind, it needs to be based on merit, nothing it, else. Exactly. It, it, when I say colorblind, I mean, you're not judged based on, the, oh, don't hire that guy, he's black, or he, he's... Uh, you know, it's a woman. I don't want a woman in the job. I mean, if if um, if, if that's stupid, ignorant prejudice that is not acceptable to me in any way. But if it's a specific case, um, like Mexicans in a Mexican restaurant, because frankly, that's what customers want. They don't want Lisa and Sally. Okay. They wouldn't okay, think let's it's, let's it's a legitimate Mexican example. place. Let's go to a specific example. You just talked to Eli for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of get a basic idea about his how smart he is how capable he is do you think he could do this job which job is it appealing to inner city blacks to get them to register to vote do i think he'd be good at that versus an inner city black person no eli what were you supposed to do actually specifically i think he's interviewing now again somewhere he stepped away it's okay but anyway, I'm sure he could have handled the deal. And most likely he wasn't hired exactly for the same reasons that everybody moans that other people don't get hired. It's the same. Like I said, it all it needs to be... Eli? Can you hear me? Yeah, what was the job? Know. What was the job, Eli? It was signing yeah, up... Yeah, I can hear you. What was the job requirements? What were you supposed to do? I think he's got technical glitches. Or so he's obviously been sabotaged. 
Yeah. His, his connection has been hacked. But I agree with him. This deal with was trying to make it as a you know specific cultural, non-cultural, or anything else. It's it's a very slippery slope. If you simply go by merit, that's all that really needs to happen. That's how things are done in most companies uh, anyway. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't need to go beyond you know colorblind, non-colorblind. Has nothing to do with anything. If somebody is able to do the job and do it well, they should be able to get hired. That's all. Doesn't matter you know where they're from, what they do. Eli, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. I what was the specific uh, of the job requirement? What were you supposed to do? Uh, go uh, into neighborhoods and talk to people and get them to register to vote. Okay. And you think take you down their information and then go submit it. You think you could have done that kind of deal? Absolutely. I mean, like I could obviously, I wouldn't expect them to send me into a neighborhood where people spoke Spanish or Haitian, right. but right. I can speak English, so there's no reason why I couldn't go into a neighborhood where people were black and spoke the same language as me. <laughs> was it yeah. like an inner city black neighborhood? I mean, let's stop dancing. What, what was the neighborhood? I mean, what kind of neighborhood was it? I was I mean, not one neighborhood. It was just a number of neighborhoods, and they were not really bad neighborhoods. I mean, was it primarily yeah. black? Some or people would like Hispanics yeah, or primarily mixed? black, yes. Okay. I, see, I think if, if, and this was to get them to register to vote? Yes. Was it for a political organization or like the re local registrar? No, it was, a, it's an organization, a for profit, uh, but, the, but they're a political organization. I, I assume it wasn't the NRA. Anyway, yeah. It was the NRA, obviously. The, the, it was the Tea Party trying to get you to um, go in the. So yeah. I, I, don't, I think, I don't know. If if it was purely based on the color of his skin, I would say I would be surprised if they had a conversation that lasted longer than 30 to 40 seconds with him where they would have turned him down. That just doesn't make any sense. Cause I any did. I had a conversation about five to ten minutes with the guy. And, uh, and, and my sense, you know, from – I mean, he never came right out and said it, but my sense was that he did not feel that – I should go be going into those kinds of neighborhoods. I can almost understand the thinking, and yet, you know, I would have done the job, and you know, they wouldn't have had any of the problems with me that they ended up having with a lot of the workers they did hire. So, well, I think that was a mistake on their part. We can all agree on that. That was their loss. So, but it's it's tough to prove that, you know, unless. You have a lot of numbers in this case. You know, we'll see. So this is a good, interesting thing. And I'll look at comments in just a moment um, while we get geared up on the... Uh, this is... I guess this is only on Android, so it's kind of a Monday thing. But I think, Eli, you were really excited about this and very impressed with the number of languages involved. But Google has launched... Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's going to come out on iOS or Windows, but uh, they've launched a handwriting input for text and is it emoji or emoji? How the, what is the obsession with this? I mean, happy faces 2.0. What was wrong with the colon, the hyphen, and the end parentheses? I'm old. Uh, well, I think I'm it's, old. It gets, it's boring, but, you know, I'm finding that on, on my phone, I have the emojis for texting. But when I, when I want to do something like via Facebook or 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 Instagram for instance I don't have those cute little graphics like an actual they... little guy laughing and chuckling and scratching his belly and it, but no. it, it would work from Android it's to Android but a... it, it wouldn't work from Android no. to iOS or vice versa right unless you were using like WhatsApp or some app that they both had or Facebook I think yeah I don't know so also know. but the real thing here is um, the ability to do cursive and hmm. it works in like 80 some languages so what do you guys think I, of this i tried to write it in english and it to me it blew my mind just how capable this thing is with writing cursive what's the trying, app trying to no it's the that new input thing that google came out and oh. and it is absolutely mind-blowing how good this thing is in, in figuring out the handwriting because i was trying to write a word and then like the last three letters i was writing the word amazing the last three letters wound up being towards the end of the screen so I kind of wrote, kind of going down sideways, you know, I mean, I can barely read it. And the thing still figured out what it was. So I think it's much more than just handwriting. It's got some intelligence built in, and it's amazingly good 
in terms of handwriting recognition. Amazingly good, from my experience. Alan, I guess it was out there. I don't know. So what are they pushing out? What are they pushing out, Oleg, for your it's, Android? It's, a, though? it's an app called Input. I can't remember. I don't have my phone with me. Okay. If, if you if you look for it, you, you'll find it's a Google app, and you install it, and then you know you get like a little world icon on your keyboard, and then if you click on it, then you're able to go ahead and you can write one letter at a time, or you can write you know multiple letters, and it's just amazingly good handwriting recognition amazing it's great to see how this has evolved i mean i still remember you know i still held back to original palm input um and that was great but you know you had a to learn how to do it correctly so this is world is it like an input method keyboard or oh. yeah once you install it it winds up being like say you click on a little world and you can either do it by hand by you know writing by hand or you click on it again and you get back to the regular keyboard so either way is it like Google Keyboard or Google? It's Hin part. Of, it's Google part. It becomes part Hindi of Google Keyboard. Input? Is it? Is it uh, Hindi input? The Google. No, no, no. This is a new app to install. Yeah, um, it's a new app. Okay. So I, I only see. Keyboard. I only. I only see the two. Google Keyboard and Google Hindi Hindi input. No, this is this is a new app that you can install. Um, yeah, no, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm trying to find a uh, Google handwriting input. Right, exactly. Oh. Okay. And you can locate it on the Google Play Store, or I'm probably about to send you That's the URL for that. Yeah, it's great. I don't have you play with the thing? I have not had a chance to play with it yet, no. No, uh, it's amazing. It's absolutely just blew my mind how good this thing is, considering how scratchy my handwriting is in cursive. And like I said, I was trying to bunch up a bunch of letters together. Ah. There you it's go. still it still was just amazingly good at, at recognizing the thing just perfectly just amazing so I definitely recommend installing it for everybody on on their androids so you could just do it with your finger then yep you can do finger you can do stylus yeah whichever yeah, you well, want to do it. i i have like on my no um, i have a note tablet so but. yeah yeah it's, it's a, i think yeah. it's especially good for tablets because you have a lot more room but even i, I try on my you know i have lg3 uh, and it still was just like I said, just blew my mind how good this thing is. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of uh, there's a few five stars. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely okay. a five star app, no question there. Okay. And like I said, I think it has some intelligence behind it, not just plain old recognizing of pixels. I think it you know looks at words and things, and I got a question, and it does a good job, really good job. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go to comments here real quick, but let me ask. I want to ask you a follow up. This is Richard, 19, high school senior. We were discussing um, television quality content. Like there's linear television, like channel ABC, CBS, NBC, and the cable channels, Fox News, CNN, Discovery Channel. Then there's like the streaming services, like um, Netflix and, and Amazon Prime, Instant Video. And then there's Facebook and YouTube. And I find um, I've even set up the Netflix app on your phone and the Prime app. And you seem to have no interest in that. You're more into Facebook and YouTube video. And I, I think we were talking about how you don't find the quality. I said it's a generation gap. I said the young people are absolutely going there for their saturation video. Is that that's not just you, right? That's like all your classmates. Yeah. For like music. I'm closer so I can hear you. Yeah. For music, we'll normally use like a music app, that, something that'll download music, or we'll go on YouTube, look it up, or, or we'll go on Pandora for the most part. When, when you showed me Amazon Music, I had never heard of it. I never even knew it existed. That's the free service that comes with Amazon Prime. It's but, pretty cool. But once I actually gave it a try, and it's kind of like Spotify, really. And I had the offline service, like I have music downloaded in, in the cloud. All I have to do is open up the app, and now I can just play music through the cloud. But as far as the video, you have access to traditional television, and you have access to Netflix video and Amazon Prime video, and you seem to have almost zero interest in those things. You seem to be perfectly fine, and not just music's different, um, but for actual content. You, you prefer the shorter length YouTube and Facebook type clips versus a 30-minute or 60 minute or movie length feature that would be on one of these traditional services. Is that right or not? That's just in my preference. Most people my age and 
the Generations Below mine, mm -hmm. watch Netflix all the time. I, I can ask a friend, okay. what did you watch on Netflix today? They'll tell me six or seven different shows that I've never heard of. Okay, so it's just your preference. It's yeah. okay. I'm just different. Yes. Yeah, I think yes. I think Ben, you know, I obviously I see what Ben watches. And, you know, he's ten and a half. And he does a lot of both. I mean, he watches a lot of Netflix. He also watches Amazon Prime for some stuff. And he also watches YouTube a lot. And my daughter, who's 12 and a half, she watches YouTube mostly. She doesn't do long movies. She does, like you said, Dan. So I think uh, it is a preferential deal for you know certain kids. They do watch a lot of YouTube, no question about it. But they also, you know, you can't watch really movies on YouTube for the most of I mean, movie movies. I mean, you go to Netflix because there's so many of them. And, so and it's, not, it's, it's because they're not on there. If right. If you wanted to exactly. watch Field of Dreams, exactly. you, you, you can't. Exactly. It's not on YouTube. Exactly. 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 If you want to watch that. You know, in my case, you know, I wanted to watch House of Cards. I wanted to watch, you know, all, all these different movies, basically, that they have on Netflix and stuff. But so. one thing that seems to be the common thread for, for Ben and for your daughter and for, so we're talking age 10 and a half to 19, is that none of them are really particularly into traditional television. No, they're not. The appointment television, you know, you have to get home at 8 o'clock or you have to DVR. Right, exactly, exactly. And that's why, because, you know, schedules, you got school, you got different things going on. It's much more convenient to just flip the YouTube and, and do it that way. And speaking of YouTube, by the way, uh, not YouTube, but speaking of Chromecasting, because, uh, you know, we use that a lot at home. I also have uh, Amazon's Fire Stick. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you knew or not, but they're totally compatible. In other words, I can actually use the Chromecast app on the phone with a fire stick plugged into TV and it works just fine. Did you oh, know that? neat. I didn't know that. Yeah, it totally, I, I did it accidentally one time and it started working. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I, I didn't put Chromecast back in. It just has the fire stick in the TV and it totally streams, totally fine. So is there any advantage of the Chromecast versus the fire stick? Or, or... There is no advantage per se in each of the other. The advantage is you don't have to have two if you want to use if you want to Chromecast anything from Netflix, mm -hmm. you can, you know, instead of using the interface that uh, Fire TV has, you can just do regular Chromecast directly from the Netflix app. Can I do Prime Instant Video from my phone and turn it into the Chromecast? You can do, right. If you have the app, yeah, of course, of course, okay. exactly. Because I think you things. could initially. Initially, you could not, there was no Prime ability to watch on Android. That's why you couldn't do okay. anything. But no, but then they add, they added the app that you can download that did allow you to stream Amazon movies. I mean Amazon Prime stuff. And then of course if you have Chromecast, then you can Chromecast as well. That I has think nothing the, to do with the other part. How much time he almost never sits on a desktop computer, um, or a, a traditional television set. He prefers his phone. Right. Um, is that the same thing with your two kids? Yeah. Basically, I mean my kids don't have phones of their own, so they either borrow mine or my wife's. Or they, uh, you know, they have tablets, so they use right. a tablet too. And and in uh, in and uh, Rita, uh, she usually just uses like a Chromebook, and she does the YouTube. That's mostly what she does. She doesn't watch Netflix movies; just her preference. So you have so a television. You have a television at home. It just sits there, and the kids, even if they, they have the ability, they they have no interest in sitting on the couch, turning the television on, and scanning the bands ben, like we would at their age. Ben actually, you know, even though he watches a lot of stuff on Chromebook. I encourage him because of his eyesight, so he doesn't ruin it, not to watch something for this long, this close. Okay. So basically, I kind of semi-force him to watch it to Chromecast. And he likes Chromecasting. I mean, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's much nicer to look at a 42-inch TV than to watch a movie on a little dinky 11-inch screen. I mean, right. It's always nicer. Sound is better. Everything is better. But in so, the yeah, end, so it's, it's still generating, I mean, choosing something from a mobile device and then watching it on a larger screen. But it's still right. not really watching NBC or CBS or ABC. No, we do not. We cut cable. We do not watch it. None of us right. watch that. Yeah. Anymore. Okay. It's, it's gonna be even, even though I did put an antenna so we can have local channels, so we can watch ABC, NBC, CBS, because of the antenna thing. I mean, one of those antennas you've got. You know what I mean? Okay. One of those $50 cost videos. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Reed Hastings was talking about, he said uh, that he's the head of Netflix and they just had a wonderful quarter, or they had right. an earnings report. I don't know if, I, I don't know if it's a quarter, whatever it was. And uh, their stock just went through the roof, and it was. He talked about. Um, he said his competition. He said this before in different ways, but he was pretty forthright about. It. He said his competition is not Amazon Prime or HBO Go or whatever it is. His competition is uh, traditional television. He said it's got a twenty-year life expectancy at best. He thinks. I think they're going to start falling, but um, just like 
newspapers, paid newspapers. No, I totally agree. Because, yeah. because the big difference is, like you said, I can watch whatever I want whenever I want. Yeah. So if you have that open flexibility, as long as you have the selection ability, one of the reasons I think Amazon is trailing, and you know, if they get their act together, they wouldn't have to trail Netflix, is the the uh, the, the the quantity of content. Having the same thing as Netflix, or as much as it is not enough. They need to have something a little bit beyond that. And so that's the trick if they can figure it out. But yeah, in terms it, of anybody else, I mean, what can the real studios, what can ABC do possibly? What can they do? They can start a service similar to Netflix. Yeah. But they already have Netflix. And they already have market share. Because people you still want mean? something that's the quality of a House of Cards or an Orange is the New Black, um, a CSI Miami. They, they like these shows. And right. they're very expensive to produce, and the model that there's they cannot pay for those with a YouTube model. It's just not happening. They will if they all went to YouTube, they would not be able to uh, um, no, but have Netflix that quality of content. But the Netflix model works. Yeah, it you does. Get people to, yeah, and so that's all they need to do. Well, we don't know. It's kind of like when Sirius hired Howard Stern. We don't know because they haven't really broken out if that was a good thing in the end, what they paid him, what they earned. But they got a lot of attention. They got new subscribers, so maybe it works. But um, we'll see. I, I just worry. I don't like the exclusive model that we've had before, but I do like some of the content that the vast wealth that that model produced has created for me to watch. And um, I worry about the dumbing down of the quality of content when it goes to these other new newer models that just don't pay any money. Okay, so next up is um, I see hard well, numbers. The reason the initial deals were because they were monopoly. There was nobody else doing it, so they got all the money and they, you know, charged whatever they wanted, and that, that's the only reason that became what it became. Like we talked before, there's a tremendous number of really crappy shows on regular TV. I mean, it's not like all those sure. are solid hits or anything. So it's, you know, it's one of those deals. They're they're trying to do cheap filler and the reality stuff and the race and the Dancing with the Stars and I just, I mean, but those, I think those are very popular shows. They're just not my cup of tea. I mean, I would sooner have bamboo shoots stuck up my nails than have to watch Dancing with the Stars. The next story, and then I swear to God, I'm going to get comments while Alan's talking about this. Alan, did you check this? Um, this was right before we printed, and so I, I haven't, I, I honestly don't remember reading much of it. But this is uh, entitled Hard Numbers for Public Posting Activity on Google+. Plus. Uh, you know, you really need to warn me before you actually go to real What's the topics? next one in the Flipboard? I'm sorry, you're probably... No, they're randomly ordered on Flipboard. Are they? I'm, I'm just going from... Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was in the first in, last no, out. No, I have no idea how they're ordered, but it's the certainly The Philo not accounting good. method. So, yeah, when you actually go to a, a legitimate story, I, I'd like to know it. <laughs> um, okay, so the debate on the activity level of, of Google Plus has raged for years. How many users are really active on it? Is the uh, place a ghost town? Why is not Google shut it down already? Well, I decided to put it to the test, so I did a hardcore analysis of 516,000 randomly selected Google Plus profiles, and this post has a scoop for you. Randomly selected, so you're going to get a bunch of spammers on there, just like you would on Twitter. And Facebook, I get these hot girls with no common friends, and they're adding me, and they have no profile uh, information, and I'm so not accepting that. Um, to get on some lists since you created number of profiles with no content 465,000 so this initially was slightly over half a million um, percentage of valid profiles with no content 90.1 and I don't know I mean the only way to I, I'd say he's probably accurate because we all see them they didn't even have a picture a lot of them came on in July of 2011 I think it was to sign up because they'd heard about the new thing and none of their friends were on here and there was no discovery and then they didn't do anything maybe they posted one thing like hello world or whatever um so yeah th these are not great numbers anybody have any thoughts on this no i didn't I, look through the numbers carefully enough to to examine their their analysis okay um to be perfectly honest okay so I see this looks interesting. A couple things here, Alan, if you want to just peruse them real quick. Um, I see the math problem for 14 year old is stumping the world. I'm going to do comments in a sec while you peruse these and why everyone went nuts over Hillary Clinton's new logo. Um, the funny thing I saw there was it looks like the hospital sign with the arrow. 
And then, um, okay. I think so, the math problem is the interesting one. Okay, well, go ahead, check that one out. And the other thing, and let me let me look for comments here. Um, well, I mean, I, I made a post about the the the, math, the the logic problem. I think it's good, mostly because I think you know most of the time what I'd seen a lot of are people posting things like you know. One plus one times one minus one divided by one. What you know? What's the answer? And the answer is, you know, if you remember your math from third grade, you can answer it easily. Um, this required a little bit more thought, and you know, I like things that require a little bit of thought. Can you describe it? The math problem. What was that? Can you describe the math problem? Uh, the math problem. The it's it's a logic problem, really. Um, basically, what it is is it presents a problem saying that um, two people are trying to determine the birthday of a third person. The, so, so I think it's Alfred and Ben are trying to get Cheryl's birthday. Cheryl tells one of them, Cheryl tells both of them all of the possibilities that it could be. There are 10 possibilities. Tells one of them the day that it is and the other one the month that it is. And from there, they then make a couple of other statements from which they're able to deduce what the actual birthday is. So you're then led down this path of trying to deduce what the birthday is yourself. And it's a, it's a good logic challenge. It's not impossible, but it's, you know, it's a bit tricky. Um, and I've seen people in discussing it. It's interesting how some people took uh, the approaches that everybody took, some of which were quite different than the one that I took. So it was refreshing for me to see how it was approached. Um, well, yeah, we see these, I mean, you see them on Facebook and everywhere you see these things, one that I thought was fun because it challenges you. And someone said, how many squares are in this? Right. But here's the thing. You see that square puzzle. And once you've seen it once, you can solve every other square puzzle. They're all exactly the same. Right. Okay. Once you've seen, once you've been taught how to do that and what the trick is, then they're all identical. Once you're taught the trick to order of operations, all of those order of operations questions are identical. The nifty thing about logic puzzles is, even though you're told that it's a logic puzzle, there's still a bit of a challenge to it, and that's enjoyable. Yeah, I agree. They're different. You know, I, I, I can teach you how to solve this puzzle, and it will give you, it will help you a little to solve the next puzzle, but it won't give you the answer. I teach you how to solve the how many squares are there and you'll get the answer for the next one as well. Yeah, it's you... Rubik's Cube. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's it's shuffled it in a different way, but the, you figured out how to solve Rubik's Cube. You, you can do it. A couple comments here. Um, iRobot is concerned with spam and commercial saturations, says Michael Thomas. is uh, On the story about the, the um, allegation of ethnic and or racial bias, in favor of South Asian, primarily Indian, so by a company, a potential class action lawsuit. Is there a language requirement, asks Andrew Kaufman. Not many non-South Asians in the U.S. speak Hindi or Bengali or Telugu. Interesting question. Um, and yet another data point that I'm not aware of from this uh, light delving into the article. And then Andrew Kaufman notes that agriculture workers are covered under H2A visas, not h H-1B. And um, Michael Thomas, why are none of you paying attention to the tax break incentives? So I hadn't thought of that either. So um, they're all in Arizona for uh, I wanted to batteries. follow up with one more thing. The other reason why uh, delivering advertising via HTTPS is important is because web pages themselves are now delivered through HTTPS and mixing secure and insecure content is a really bad idea for a number of reasons. So this now makes it so that if you're delivering your content securely, you can also deliver your advertising securely. And that solves a whole bunch of problems. Okay. None of which are solved on this program. So, um, all right, so the comment tracker is sort of working. And I see that there was... How do I tell if it's a live comment? If I look at the thing... What, what's the difference, Alan, between... Like, I'm looking here at the player, right? So... 
I see it. Is it next to the player, public view, it says comments. Is that a comment on the video, or is there a live comment that's different that's not being picked up by, by the API for the comment tracker? Because someone asked about that earlier. I have no idea, to be honest. My understanding, however, are the live comments for YouTube are no, aren't picked up via the API. Hmm. But that's my understanding. I, I have not investigated it deeply. Okay. But we still love Gerwin, and he's going to work all this out. That's Hopefully. right. Because he's the man. Um, all right, so have we covered all the official topics? Dr. Furstenberg, is there anything else you're dying Sorry, to? I hope we have. What's up with this logo thing, Hillary Clinton's logo? Who freaking cares? I thought her video was good. Did you like her video? I didn't watch it. It was good. You should watch it. It was well done. Um, mm -hmm. Any predictions on who the Republican nominee will be? Ted Anyone? Cruz? I hope, I'm sure Hillary hopes he is. I have no predictions whatsoever mm -hmm. on politics. I'm not saying favor. I'm saying who do you think will win? I would guess it's going to be Bush versus Clinton. I think the money's on that. But we'll see. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a change of pace? All right. So anyway, um, how was your week, Sheila? In well, West, week, West week Jordan, Utah? Two weeks. Yeah, it's been a little while. You were off. You were at anyway, the Betty Ford Clinic for a while, right? Because you that's, running, yeah, that's, running with some wild crowd. That that's right. Yeah, they locked me up and threw away the key, <laughs> <laughs> and I escaped. <laughs> um, I like the update to Snapseed for my phone. I heard about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Snapseed is the oh god. Okay, oh, Alan will weigh in on Alan. that. <laughs> Snapseed is um, how do you describe what's different about that and like Instagram it's and a, these others? What, what? It's a much better photo editing tool than Snapseed ever is or will be. <laughs> what S Snapseed is better or Instagram's better? Snapseed is better for editing your photos. Well, I know Vic and Dotra, the former Google Plus head uh was falling over himself praising the new snapseed and i don't know i guess it's an android thing or both i think it's no, on it's both, both but but they they both. did some updates um so i it's, guess uh how do you how do you like to use it i mean obviously i guess you could add a border maybe add a watermark or what, what does it do no or, no you can't do, you do borders or watermarks but you can enhance your photos you can give it some blur some lens blur or or all kinds of pictures Okay. Um, you can, you know, saturation, contrast, uh, sharpening, all kinds of stuff. Today, um, but, I did a photo. I posted on, on all my, everything. And it was, I was just at a red light and there was a beautiful double rainbow. Mm. And I don't know if I've seen one. If, if I have seen one before, it wasn't recently that I can recall. It was just gorgeous. And Richard actually was in the car. I picked him up from school. And he noticed it and said, oh, my gosh, look at that. And so I took a picture. What might I do with Snapsea? What would you do with, with a shot like that of a pretty blue sky with double rainbow? Well, you can edit it. And they use also select, selective editing on there, too. But you can make the sky pop. You can saturate it to where your, your sky is a lot more not so bland. You could do things like saturate just the rainbow. So right. the colors on the rainbow pop out more from the blue back. Right, right. Okay. That's, a, that's selective, selective. Uh, that's a selective tool. Right. Even you know there are things that I've done with double rainbows. In fact, where I've essentially made a black and white photo except for the rainbows itself, and that really makes them stand out. So you can do things like that, and and Snapseed mm -hmm. is pretty good at that now. Right. So, the first thing I can recall with it was that a common thing before Steven Spielberg used it, and I forget what the movie was, but it was it was a, about a German the German camp and Hitler's List. Yeah, was that he did it really poorly there, by the way? Even for the for the uh, technology of the time, he did it poorly. Yes. Okay. There 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 have there have been colorized elements in otherwise oh. monochrome scenes. In fact, back when the only thing you had were black and white photos. They did your black and white movie prints. They you did use to colorize specific elements by individually colorizing each frame. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you look at some of Walt Disney movies, for example, if I remember correctly, they had some colorized black and white movies and they did it by essentially animating the color hmm. on top of a black and white film stock. My all time favorite, completely unrelated, and I want to get your view on Snapseed movie story was um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson when he talked to James Cameron about the sky and the Titanic. And he said that it's wrong at the sinking scenes. Apparently, uh, Cameron just threw up some random sky, <laughs> or like had the angle wrong. And Tyson's like, "That is wrong." And and he like was was trolling. And Cameron fixed it in subsequent release of the movie to make sure that it was accurately showing the the right sky and the right angle. Alan, what do you think about Snapseed and the new release of it? I've been playing with it since I was able to get it, and I, I I'm I'm mixed in several ways. There are things that I like about it. Um, there are things that I might like about it if I could figure out how to actually get them to work correctly. Like what? Like, let me let me pull it up again because, <laughs> um, like, I kind of like brush. The basically the, what the brush strokes let you do is they let you make sweeping gestures and make sweeping changes over it. But what you can do is very limited, so you can't do a brush blur, for example. Oh, I wouldn't know. I haven't figured out yet how to do a spot blur. I can do spot focus, but not spot blur. No, I haven't figured out. I just figured out the spot thingy. I can add more flower. I can add more clouds in there if I wanted to. Right. And what's but, a but what's a practical that application for a spot blur? Um, they've got. What was that, Dan? What's the practical application? Like, when would you want to use a spot blur? Like, what kind of photo? I want would to blur your cool? face out. I want to blur out a license plate. Okay. Um, I was thrilled to see that they added spot repair. Yeah. That that was great. My problem. That's what I'm saying. I, my, what I'm having problems with spot repair though is I want to repair a teeny tiny little dot, and I go and touch it, and it puts this big blob there. Um. Let's try this. So I. You, you know, know what? You can. Uh, you can. So oh, where, wherever you're at, you can, no, you can't. <laughs> so, uh, so I've got feelings like that. I'm well, disappointed can... that they still haven't figured out how to do white balance, which they should have figured out by now. Yeah. And I'm going to be really, really pissed off if this comes to Google. Well, I want a web version, but if this comes and replaces the current editor that we have which desperately needs replacing they're still not giving it the tools that it needs that's right they need to i want to add text to my photos right we need text i'm i'm shocked that this version now takes away borders it takes away it does are could you find them i couldn't frames where um let's see oh Oh, look there. If I scroll down, uh -huh. oh, that's obvious as shit. <laughs> <laughs> Something else. Well, see, I told you it's there. You just have to look. Alan oh, is so naughty. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. anyway, way to have an incredibly crappy user interface. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, wow. Maybe the, it's not as bad as Google AdWords or AdSense. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, Sheila, any uh, any really other cool stuff going on in uh, West Jordan, Utah? What was well, this? Any interesting well, gossip? Uh, gossip? Uh, no gossip. Just Utah had a freaky, freaky snow windstorm the other day, and then snow. But the winds were like oh, 50, 60 miles an hour in the valley at one point. But in your section of Utah, it's pretty conservative. So like a scandal it might is. be the neighbor's is, lawn's well, a little high or something, you know. You know, it depends on where you're at. But even in my little neighborhood, our neighbor's mm -hmm. fence kind of like laid to the ground. It's like I left work and it was still up. An hour later, I come home, it's down. So the wind did it or what was it? The wind. The wind caught it. And just, wow. Well, the... Of course, well, the fence was pretty weak as it was. 
so it didn't take much to was it an older like a wooden fence or what was it yeah it's a wooden fence but Interesting. It's like, okay we want some chain link fence now <laughs> they just don't build them like they used to no i mean it's like we're in utah it's like weather is unpredictable and it's like everybody's complaining about the snow and i'm just going like well we're not back east so be grateful for that thanks obama but, but for that first day of snow it's like okay i don't like it i'm not happy <laughs> but yeah i'm not a big snow guy get over it. No. my skiing days are over yeah. all right well we thank you for popping in mm -hmm. again and you hung up longer than usual this is great um yeah good for you alan Furstenberg. how was your week sir good excellent <laughs> anything <laughs> any interesting stuff going on in new york uh maybe but i can't talk about some of it yet um it no, it, it's, it's it's an interesting month we're coming up on io so we're seeing either a lot of products being released or a lot of products being held back. Um, and it's interesting seeing, uh, seeing what's released and what isn't. Um, the other big thing I want to mention is there are a whole lot of Google products that are being officially shut down on Monday. And all of these are, yeah, Sheila's making this face like, what? I haven't heard of any products. Um, these are products ranging from old methods of logging in. Uh, Helpouts will officially shut down on Monday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The moderator thing, right? Yeah, well, the Helpouts? No, oh. Yeah, that one. No, isn't there a Google moderator that's about... I, didn't, I don't I think it's shutting down this soon. Well, but um, from a developer point of view, there's a pile mm. of APIs that are being turned off. Um, so... You know, if uh, if you were using things like OAuth 1.0 or older authentication methods, um, there are a number of, of old APIs, which hopefully you're aware of, that are, are going away. I don't even have the full list of them. That place where you could put code. Right? Isn't that shutting down? That's in a couple of years. Oh, okay. That was just announced. These are things, these are products that have been announced for like three years now that are going away. And it's all happening Monday, so all of the developers are, are anxious about, you know, we can't wait to see what questions we get. Now, do you think um, the, the, the term Google Plus is going to be mentioned in the main I.O. keynote? It wasn't last year for the first no. time since its inception. No, I don't think it'll be mentioned. Are we going to have Google Plus in two years? I'll say the same thing that I've been saying for four years now, Dan. Yes, we are. I don't think it'll be the same form that it was when it started. Don't think it'll be the same form it is now. But yes, we will. Maybe it'll be enhanced. Well, I'd like to see it enhanced. It, it yeah. would be nice to get an enhancement at some point in, the, in four years. What I don't, what I'd like to have is, you know, the way it is, you can, you can put a post out there. Hardly anybody sees it. It's stupid. Well, any other thoughts, Alan? <laughs> On what? Anything? Anything? You want it's your platform, your soapbox. No. You're in Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner. Use it or lose it. My week was good. Um, it was actually really bad. You got a minute? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I uh, My radio days are over for, for a little while. The... Uh, I was doing it on Saturday on his network in Virginia and the host is apparently switching to the main competitor station. And I guess he got a, so I'm, I was doing the one segment. He said it was, it was their most popular segment or whatever. He probably says that to each person in the segment. Um, but anyway, it was a great run. It was almost a year. It was a lot of fun and it forced me to really delve into some stuff. And I would usually spend a couple hours. It's a lot of prep like sometimes two and a half hours for a, a 15 minute thing and uh, to try to get it right. So I had a great time. It was fun. I think I did a good job and um, you know, I may pop up. I don't know if, if that network or the other one, they're both two networks. So I don't know if I'll end up, but we'll see. Maybe their people will talk to my people and we'll find out. But anyway, so that, that I won't be on the radio tomorrow, but um. I uh, 
Maybe you can get some sleep. That's yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to that aspect of it. But we did make um I made a today we made some pizza dough and for tomorrow and we made some sauce. We're working on a uh a pretty good sauce. It's a cooked sauce which the purists will be outraged at. And there's Ooh. even a quarter teaspoon of sugar in it, which the purists, Ooh. the true purists, if you don't have a buffalo in your freaking backyard making the cheese, there it's not real pizza, right? And um, but uh, anyway, I'm trying to come up with something that the kids and the adults will like. So I think it's pretty good. And then also we made garlic knots when I was in Waynesville, North Carolina. Oh, An absolutely so good. beautiful, beautiful place. We made garlic knots, and Sheila is, is in a, having convulsions at the thought. Well, well, because talk for a second. I'll show you. I'll show you the garlic knots. We there's make. our local. It's called the Pizza Pie Cafe. They have garlic knots, and oh, that's the best thing. And then their carbonara sauce, silver noodles. Oh, okay. I'm hungry. I'm gaining weight just talking about it. So it's super easy <laughs> to add insult to entry here, Sheila. This is. Um, these are the garlic knots. Let me get them up on the screen here. It's just little pizza dough. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah. You take a Yours looks burned. No, it's just a little charred because we I use a uh my pizza oven. But they're delicious. Oh. Absolutely delicious. Yeah, I've mm. seen those. And, yeah, so you just um, take they um are, they're good. I have a blackstone pizza oven. It gets up to fifteen hundred degrees, but I, I we did these oh. like three fifty. Or 400, I think. So, do you have a recipe for your garlic sauce? It's uh, olive oil, garlic powder. I didn't have enough okay. actual garlic, and I was in a hurry. Um, parsley, salt, and pepper. And I put some uh, Parmesan cheese, but that's mm -hmm. that's not in the traditional recipe, but it adds a little jazz. No, add, that's yeah, it. With, yeah. You take a pizza dough, mm -hmm. and you take a pizza cutter, and you cut it, slice it. There's a million YouTube mm -hmm. videos, and they're all basically the same recipe. You do a pizza you know, rolled out like a round pizza, like like yeah. a little Caesar did crazy bread. Use your pizza yeah. cutter and slice just, half inch strips and you wrap them around your finger and then stick it in there and you got a little knot mm -hmm. and then you set them on the thing and I just stick them in the oven as, as the thing goes around. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done, you don't put anything on them. Then you dip, you put them in a bowl and then you pour your olive oil with the garlic, salt, pepper and the parsley and optionally mm -hmm. Parmesan cheese and then you toss it just like a salad. Mm -hmm. If it's too dry, mm -hmm. add a little more olive oil. Um, and, and they're them. absolutely fantastic, and they're very, very filling. And then you do you bake them? You bake them with? first. You bake them. You just first? take regular oh. pizza dough. You don't do anything to it. You take regular pizza dough. You put it in whatever oven you usually make a pizza, and then mine cooked in probably ninety seconds, two minutes, something like that. But in a home mm -hmm. oven, it would be my pizza oven's real fast. It can cook a pizza in like in a minute. But there's another show you could do, Dan's cooking show. I know, I have uh I got <laughs> some on shops. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh so that was my week. Um we got the paper out, but it was twelve hours mm -hmm. late, which was uh, not good. So I am on like three hours sleep, so I'm even more of a zombie than usual. Well, yeah, because it's midnight now for you. It is, it is. And midnight here is a little wilder than it is in West Jordan, Utah, I would guess. Oh, probably. <laughs> You're probably the only one up in the whole city. Uh, Plus nine no. there. Thank you all for watching. We appreciate it. We have two programs. Thanks to Sheila and to Eli and Kevin, who came in earlier before we went live. To um, Oleg, always good to see him. And it, uh, my only regret is we didn't get to see his wonderful kids. We were so, so much fun. And uh, thanks to Alan, as always. Uh, we have two programs. Google, uh, we have this program, and we have on Monday night, we have uh, our Android Week, which is a news program about Android topics. That's Mondays at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Google Plus and YouTube Live. Monday at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, our Android Week. We have a Flipboard magazine for that as well. Check it out. And uh, we also have this program, which is every Friday at 8.30 to 9 p.m. Uh, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. No, yeah. On Friday night, Google Plus Week, the longest running show on Google Plus. In more ways than one. Google Plus Week, Fridays, 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, or sometimes 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Google Plus and YouTube Live. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. Uh, check out the Flipboard Magazine for that as well. And um, circle all of us on Google Plus or find us elsewhere. We're on all the, all the cool platforms. Thank you very much. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thanks to the panel. Until next time, have an excellent, epic, awesome uh, garlic knot 
Google Plus week. Thanks.